All right, we're going to call the meeting to order. Uh, today is Monday, July 31st, 2023. We're at the Arvin Education Center. This is the regular monthly scheduled meeting of the Oldham County Board of Education. Our first order of business. Sir, do you have any changes to the agenda? No, ma'am. Okay, can I have a uh, motion to approve the agenda? Made by Mrs. Sheffer, seconded by Mr. Dodson. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. For our Pledge of Allegiance, Mr. Deeds, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance today? Oh, like it's not, yeah. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mr. Radford, Dr. Radford. Yes, ma'am, I'd like to invite Dr. Shelton to come forward and give the board uh, an, a treasurer's report update. Good afternoon. Make sure this is... Yeah. Is it coming through? It doesn't appear yeah. to be on, okay. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure. First thing I just wanted to point out to you at Mr. Dotson's suggestion, I did add numbers uh, to the files. Uh, so I'll try to refer to those as I'm tell so you'll know which file I'm speaking from. Um, so starting with the first file, uh, number one, in the PDF files there that you have um, attached to your agenda, is the uh, summary report, and uh, shows the beginning balance in our cash accounts um, and the receipts for the month, as well as the disbursements. Of course, receipts are uh, continuing to drop off as we were completing the, the year uh, since we had received all our tax receipts uh, earlier in the year. And so uh, we ended up uh, with our uh, cash balance there at $59.1 million. Uh, when you add in the uh, bonded construction funds and um, our investments, you can see that uh, list there at the bottom. And I'll then move over to the uh, report number two, the PDF number two. This has a, a breakdown uh, of the total cash. You can see in our uh, actual cash, we had 48.9 million plus the investments there for a total of $66.4 million at the, as of the end of the year. In file number three, the historical actuals report, I'm actually uh, not going to highlight anything there because I'll be talking with you about the annual financial report in a few minutes and uh, there's several highlights there that we'll want to make uh, for the entire year. But that report is uh, as you're normally used to seeing it. Uh, the fourth, uh, number four file is the historical actuals which give you a good comparison for revenue and expenditures over the last four years there for your comparison and uh, review and uh, file number seven is actually the balance sheet uh, for the month and you can see a breakdown of the balance sheet for each fund and then fund eight is the detailed income statement that uh, has all of the uh, revenues and expenses uh, for the month and for the year so I'll present this uh, report to you um, and be happy to answer any questions that you would have. First off, I want to thank you for doing it. It makes it a lot easier to okay. follow. You're very welcome. Thank you for the suggestion. Board members, do you have any questions? I do. I was going to yes. ask you under bills and funds because there was a lot about travel. How much does the district spend on travel? The, well, I, in order to answer that question properly, I would have to look at this because it comes from a variety of different funds. It doesn't all come from the general fund. A lot of that is paid for through grants that go through in uh, fund two, um, and as well as a lot is paid for at the school level uh, through school activity funds and then allocations. Uh, from state grants that they get, uh, so I can get you that number, but it's it. It would be under our school activity funds, correct? 
but I couldn't give you a total without going to each and every fund and having to get you the total to answer your so I'll Does the staff fill out forms on travel? Yes, I have to request the travel and then uh, of course after they travel they any expenses are they are completed through an expense report form. But I'll I'll get you the full total but I I would have to add up from each of the different funds. Yeah, that, that was one of my questions about would you be able to tell me total amount from each fund? Yes. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. Other questions? Okay. Your recommendations, sir? Yes, I uh, recommend to approve as presented. Can I get a motion to approve the treasurer's report made by Mrs. Sheffer, seconded by Mrs. Clem? All those in favor? And that's 5 0. Next up, we have meeting minutes to approve. Uh oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have minutes from the June 6th board meeting. Board members, do you have any questions, additions, changes to that? Can I get a motion to approve those minutes? Made by Mr. Dennis, seconded by Mrs. Sheffer. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. Uh, correct. We didn't have a meeting on June 6th. I, I think you're looking at the 26th, the other one. Oh, sorry, so. June 26th. I'm sorry. Yeah, June 26th. My bad. Um, and then we also have July 10th, special called meeting, minutes for MIT. For the July 10th meeting, board members, do you have any changes to that? Okay. Can I get a recommendation? Made by Mrs. Sheffer, seconded by Mr. Dodson. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. Sir? Next we have personnel. Um, so I would advise the board to uh, review the, uh, you've re reviewed the personnel uh, report as provided to you in your packet and just recommend that you take that uh, report under, under advisement. Board members, any questions about personnel actions? Can you give us an update on personnel? Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dennis. Yes, our uh, recruitment and retention uh, numbers are better than they have been uh, two years ago. They are a little bit better than they were this time last year, uh, but we're not where we need to be. We have done, over the last two years, last year and going into this year, we've done a 7% salary increase for staff. Um, that is 5% uh, plus the step increase, which is 1% uh, equivalency, and that's for experience, so that equates to 7% overall. But we still need to do more. Uh, I anticipate being able to provide a, the board a full report and update at the August board meeting about staffing. Um, we have uh, we have a, a handful of positions, teacher positions specifically, that we're working diligently to fill. One of the things I would point out to our board members is uh, you will see perhaps some positions posted, teaching positions, but there could be a retiree in that position, but that position continues to be posted so that um, um, we can find, maybe be able to find someone who is certified and not retired and can be in that position long term. But I, I do plan to provide a full report uh, at the end of the month meeting in August. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that uh, really the, the piece that is really classroom teachers are very, very important. Uh, one area that is really continues to be a struggle for us is students with disabilities. Our ECS teachers, our specialized uh, staff who work and care for our most vulnerable students and our classified staff. We have a lot of classified openings and that's something we really need to look at as we head into this year and make plans um, for this time next year and hopefully be in a better better position. Uh, I couldn't keep up on that email right now. Did North Multiple language teachers. Uh, to, to be honest, Mr. Dennis, that the board allocates positions to each SBDM council, and then the council decides what to do with those positions. Right. 
And the I think the other factor to your question, I appreciate your question, the other piece there, then also one of the things that we uh, that we see is that there may not be uh, qualified applicants to be able to teach a particular area, so then that creates um, quite, uh, does create some um, issues or problems for us. Well, I was, I was out of town, and I was trying to catch up. Sure. So I apologize. Uh, people texted me about what's going on. And they were talking about the My concern, besides losing the classes, you have kids that will get college credit for that. Hey, Joe, can you turn your microphone on? You would have kids that get college credit for that. Uh, where they don't have to take the college college class and if we're losing at the high school I, that hurts families sure and, and I, I appreciate absolutely appreciate we don't want anyone to have to uh, have that scenario or have that issue we're working diligently to try to problem solve um, how we can provide those options and not for our kids not to lose any of those opportunities that's certainly very very important to us uh, a challenge that we have is staffing uh, availability and being able to have someone that can provide that opportunity to those to our students there are avenues that we've exhausted in terms of whether it's uh, an online and that's not uh, the most ideal in terms of a hundred percent online opportunity uh, the other ones are working through our um, co-ops or universities to be able to provide JCTC uh, to be able to provide some opportunities and sometimes those are depending upon the content or the pathway uh, are not a hundred percent available to us what about our instructional coaches so you know one of the things that we're looking at I'll have an I'll have a report or an update at the end of this week as we get ready to have a, a clear picture of where we are as a staffing uh, and staffing needs and so then we'll be prepared to uh, support uh, in our classrooms and at our schools where and when needed so that we can that way we can be ready for school to to open all right thank you I have a question yes ma'am I think we have to acknowledge that some of these teachers are going to other districts because of lack of teacher raises, um, or comparably speaking. Um, Allison had the idea to form a committee to discuss teacher raises. Is that, how do we do that? Do we need to make a motion to create that committee, or what's the appropriate thing to? to make that move forward now instead of later? Sure, uh, Ms. Clem, I appreciate that question. We currently have several structures in place uh, to get teacher voice and to be able to problem solve. And one of those is recruitment, retention, and induction committee that we've used to have that's classified and certified staff there on that committee to give us input to be able to help solve some of those problems. If you're, the board recalls, um, again, we're not, we're, we still have more work to do, but the board approved in February 15 different individual actions for recruitment and retention, and those recommendations came from our staff, came from our, our teachers, our classified staff, and their, and their voice based upon what we were ready to do. And so then we will revisit that as we get ready to start this year. So that's, there's a natural opportunity for uh, connection and we would uh, just as we've done in the past we talked to all of our staff this past year and invited our board members to attend uh, those meetings and certainly we would do that again Wait, so who's on that committee it is uh, made up of classified and certified staff um, that I are wanted, like an outside like maybe do some outside consulting with budgets and to brainstorm different ideas like to form a new committee on just actual raises, new, not new. on actual recruitment and retention, but just on raises specifically. Well, so yes, we'd be happy to uh, to discuss that further. What I would share with the board is, before, I think before, the first step that we need to consider is uh, this here coming up in, in August, we will look at our revenues and our expenses so that our board can have a very good uh, picture of where we are. And you're gonna hear from Dr. Shelton tonight about our annual financial report as we've closed out the year. And so then once we can do that, then I can, I think that will help our board collectively and individually have an idea about how best to, how best to, um, to proceed using the structures or any new structure that we have in, wanna have in place. That's what we were just seeing in the policies going through them. There was an opportunity to form committees and some of that. So that's what kind of triggered sure. that idea. Sure. So just sort of throwing sure. that out. Good question. <clears throat> oh, one of the things, if you did form a committee, you'd want to include uh, maybe Tom on it. Mm -hmm. Because everything based on what we can afford. 
Right. For sure. No, I think we definitely would want time on that. Yeah, I think part of it is it's part of the process of um, I know you all haven't been through this yet, but um, part of the process is Tom is going to, once we wrap up August and the financials for this current year that we just wrapped up, Tom will be making recommendations to us on what we can do from a financial standpoint to have for next year going forward, what we can do uh, raise-wise and what that does to the numbers, um, which is part of what his recommendation is when we talk about ta possible tax increases or anything like that. It's going through the numbers and coming up with what what's there for us to use. And that's why I just was trying to avoid only tax increases being the only alternate, like maybe cutting expenses where, where we could, I know we look at that all the time, but just doing it on a continued basis, and I know we do, but just getting it out there for more people to be involved, to see it, to show that we're working hard to get teachers raises and exploring all avenues. So I don't want it just to be a property tax increase. Brent, how many how many people are on the RRI committee? Can you? So that's what committee is? That's the budget, what, what, budget budget committee. committee. So that's not that. Okay. So okay. maybe maybe going forward, Dr. Radford, you can include board members on when those meetings are taking place, so that if we want to sit in on those meetings, <coughs> sure. that we can come and sit in on those meetings. Sure. Would be helpful. I think that would be helpful. I just I'm hearing from teachers that don't complain about anything, who are very concerned about this. And it's not something we we need to talk about this now, not in August, not in September. We, if we don't have teachers to, to teach our kids curriculum, safety, none of that is going to matter. And we have really good teachers that we're losing because of this. My now. son's favorite teachers. And then I'm worried about my second group of kids coming through. So just trying to get ahead of it as much as possible. How, mu how much does one of these companies cost an outside firm? Do you have any idea, ballpark? Oh, I, have, I don't know anything. To analyze a budget. I mean, I know we look at it pretty tough. Has that ever no, been I'm, done before? I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about for, no, forming, for a retention and forming a committee where it's some of us, Tom, a teacher would be on there. Um, I mean, we, we need to get some thinking outside of the box here. Thanks for bringing up that up, Carly. Board members, I would just say to each of you, thank you for uh, bringing, uh, sharing those, asking those questions, and for bringing that to um, to the forefront. I can I can assure you that that's staffing and and uh, for certify for classified across our organization is extremely top priority for us, and we've done a lot. Uh, we need to continue to do more, and we'll or work to keep keep uh, our board members engaged with uh, the options that we have in front of us. One thing I will note is that to be able to get state statute does not allow its uh, individual districts. Uh, you, uh, if we have an opening for a teacher to come from another district now that school is getting ready to start, we are uh, challenged because districts will not typically let other employees out of their contract to fill a position. So we are we are at this point, we have to look at retirees. We have to look at uh, emergency certifications. We have to long, look at uh, uh, long-term substitutes. People who have perhaps done the job but are no longer working. That is where we currently are at this point. It's not where we want to be, but again, I'll, I'll give a full report in August about how we have, uh, where we are, and uh, to see how we've made some impact. Well, that goes into another problem, because I talked to a long-term sub, and she, of course, told me what she'd make if she went full-time at Jersey County like everybody else has been. But she would be at just about $14 an hour to sub. You know, these subs ain't going to do it. 
the ones that come to Oldham County do it because they really like our schools. They like the school they work for. So if that's our solution once school started or one of our solutions, then we really need to look at how do we recruit more retired teachers sure. to fill the holes. Whether that's more than an incentive of $100 every 10 days or 10 days a month. Um, I know we have unpaid salaries we used last year and maybe that's an option to use that money to pay retirees to come back. I don't know. But we got to do something and $14 an hour probably ain't going to bring us a ton of retirees back. So well, I may the, be wrong, but I'm not sure about. For, I understand for what you're saying. For a substitute, I'm saying for a substitute. Yeah, yes, we, we pay substitutes on a daily daily rate based mm -hmm. upon their rank and experience. I'm not. Uh, I understand about fourteen dollars. I haven't done that math, but I understand. Yeah. But the uh, the rate, if the board, you know, that's something that the board can help determine. Um, you know, it's something. Everything we have, we have looked at everything, and we need to continue to do that. But I want to see what works. We started in February. What has worked? What hasn't worked? And let's build on it, or go forward, and throw out all the garbage that hasn't worked. I mean, that's what it is. So we we just need to look at that. Consent items, sir. Yes, ma'am. Approval of the consent item uh, items as presented in the board packet for consideration. Board members, there are several consent items in there, including um, the usual overnight field trips and field trip requests. Um, I would like to make a motion to separate at 7D and 7G from the vote of the rest. D and G? D and G. Okay. And more specifically, if you want it, the Confucius Center, and I have questions on over that. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, so does anybody have questions about anything besides D and G? Okay. All right. Can I get a motion to approve the other consent items besides D and G? Made by Mr. Dodson, seconded by Mr. Dennis. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. Okay. D is about contracts and post-approval of contracts. So, Mr. Dennis, what is your... First of all, I, I um, color my town. Can you explain, I read what they supplied. Um, is that basically kids put in together, making their own book about? Yes, uh, Dr. Smith, can you come up uh, and share some information about that, please? Good afternoon. So Color My Town is a, it is a coloring book that's created about our county and the businesses in our county, the schools in our county, we have control over what topics go into it. It's, pub it's produced by the publisher, and they also provide copies of each of those books to all the students in our county free of charge. All right, what do we give up that it's free, or is it a government program? I mean, who yeah. publish books and say it's free? That's my question. I, my hunch is that the what what they do is look at the the businesses in our community that would like to be included they don't charge us to be included in the book and we get to review the final copy of it before it goes to press so on our end it's an opportunity and they give us we have some example books that we can share with you that just show local businesses that are a colorable format and schools or you know the school board or whoever we want to feature and then we get the final say on whether we want to go forward with it or not. And who, who is going to say the final say? Is it going to be the schools, the teacher, Mr. Rafford? All right. No, I like the idea. I'm just, I was curious because yeah. I'll use Mr. Deeves saying nothing's free. Some, True. There's always a cost to it. So. <laughs> and are they, are, so Dylan, are they the ones that go after sponsorships from the businesses? I think they, they put a call out to those businesses. 
we also, if for example, we wanted to feature our schools, they would work with us to create the colorable um, pages, and then we would, they would have like, and we can show you in the book, like a brief statement about the school. Okay. Any other questions on D? Oh yeah, not on that though. Okay, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you. All right, the Confucius Institute. Um, I'm torn on this because I truly believe in kids learning various languages, not only Spanish, but German, French, Mandarin, Arabic. However, if you ever did your research on the um, Institute, 2019, the FBI stated they do covert spying and influence operations. University of Kentucky shut their program down. Um, State Department says advances Beijing's global propaganda. Um, UK shut their program down. Western Kentucky, I believe, had to give back a ton of money. Um, I'm torn because I know East, I believe, is who uses it, but they're about to start school, and this bill comes to us now, right before school starts. But, you know, the FBI and State Department are pretty clear on it, so I'm going to have to vote no for that line item, just so you know. Um, I think the, uh, Mr. Dennis, I appreciate that. It's something that we've um, certainly very aware of what's happening across uh, in other parts of the state and the country and the world. I think that's, um, and we've watched that very closely. We haven't expanded really that those offerings. Um, and the reason it's to the board now is that's when we received it because we have uh, folks, we have personnel tied up in, in that that we have committed to uh, serving. And we've had that, you know, we've had that for probably I don't know, Dr. Smith, can you speak for five years? So we haven't changed that, and that's not been a uh, conversation that we've had about making any changes to that program, and because school is getting ready to start, that would be my concern. However, I certainly understand what you're, you know, what you're saying. I understand. I just never had the opportunity to vote on it, I so understand. that's why. Sure. I, and I, prior to that, I'll tell you, I had concerns with the access they had to our system with other kids. But I'm not wasn't in a position to speak about it then. So, but I just want to let you know why I'll vote no on okay. that line item. Was there anything else in D, Joe? That... Um, no, ma'am. That's it for D. Okay. So, your recommendations are. I would recommend to approve uh, D, which are the uh, all of the contracts as presented in your board packet. Uh, in addition to what we've discussed. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve? Can I get a motion to, can we pull out that one and can I get a motion to approve all of the other contracts that are in D besides Confucius? <laughs> and then we're still going to talk about the other one. Yes. So, okay. So pulling that one out. Pulling out Confucius. Voting okay. on the rest of them. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the rest of them minus Confucius? Yes. yes. Made by Mr. Dodson, seconded by Mrs. Sheffer. All those in favor? And that's 5 0. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, what, how do I respond to staff that we have committed to, to be in our, our buildings as a result of this? Um, because it's, we're just continuing what we've done even before I had started my, my tenure here. How do I? And with school getting ready to start, what would be the recommendation of the board to proceed with uh, handling or dealing with those personnel? Can you explain what this is? Sure. Dr. Smith, can okay. you? I can't find it. We're having trouble finding exactly where this is, and I just yeah, want I to make sure that we are looking Joe, at the correct it thing. Here? It's so that um, we can... seven enclosure D. But, but is under it, that attachment, under that a, attachment, there's a bunch of listings. Yeah. So is it, is it the first one? Sure we're looking or? at the correct thing. I, don't I, know. I print my stuff out. So, so 20, 23, 2024 20, existing uh, WK, it's WK, WK, okay, yeah, okay, okay, that makes more sense. Okay. Sorry, Dr. Uh, Smith, can you talk about it? Sure. Please. So the Confucius Institute of Western Kentucky has supplied 
middle schools with um, uh, Mandarin teachers for five to seven years, so going back multiple years. Um, the teachers are supplied at a subsidized cost, which is what made them um, an attractive option, let's say seven years back when we were starting to offer additional foreign language at the middle school level. Um, the teachers are part of our faculty and they work for our two year contracts and then um, rotate out. And we have um, the Confucius Institute of Western Kentucky places teachers in counties all across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I think that Simpson County is the home base for all of the funding and structures. Um, and um, I think that we've had a number of students that have gone through, learned Mandarin as a result of participating in those related arts classes and then either continued that education or else pivoted to another foreign language like Spanish, French, German in our high schools. It really caters to middle school students that are just getting exposed to Chinese art language culture and uh, the curriculum is fairly um, uh, uh, structured and I think that the students who have participated generally have enjoyed just an initial exposure. Um, Mandarin is a very hard language to learn so I don't know that they come out of the other end of this fluent in Mandarin, but they kind of learn the basics of a tonal language that are very different than romantic languages. So the teachers that are doing this, are they teaching something else at other times or are they coming? They teach just, um, just, that, uh, just that Mandarin class. I know at South Oldham Middle School, it's like an A and H. So you might, yes, okay. you might get Spanish or class. if a kid said they don't want to take Spanish, they'd rather take and something so why else. Would this, why is this being pulled from UK? Um, my understanding was that a few years back, um, whether it was UK or Western Kentucky University, I think that it had something to do with those universities working with the Defense Department and trying to just separate um, a foreign um, scholars working in, in, in the at the university setting, and I don't know much more of it than that. I think it had something to do with just separating defense contracts from um, other things. So what was your... It, if they got monies from the federal government, any defense contracts, any college universities, because they, the FBI alleged these were spying groups and propaganda groups that they would pull their funding. Um, they warned it, I think, in 2019, 2020, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure when it came here. about. I could be wrong, but all you gotta do is Google it and all the State Department FBI information comes out. Now, did North Old or North High just hired a Mandarin teacher, did they not? Mm, I'm not sure. Well, North Old and Middle. It's usually the, I've only seen it at the middle school level. I don't think that. And that's ever. gonna be their only language available this year, correct? Well, that's not um, and once we find a Spanish teacher for North Oldham Middle School, then they'll have Spanish also. But as of right now, we don't have a Spanish. I don't think so. So, but the, the teacher who's at Mandar teaching Mandarin right now is a part of this institute? Uh, yes. Our four Mandarin teachers were, or are, part of the Confucius Institute of Western Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, okay I'll, ahead. I'll make a motion to approve that. I'm okay with it. I'm, I know, I, I'm okay with it. Okay, so can yeah. I have a motion to approve out of D, the Confucius Institute that we took out. Made by Mrs. Sheffer, seconded by Mrs. Clem. All those in favor? All those opposed? You want to raise your hand, Joe? Okay. And it passes 3-2. Thank you for explaining it. No problem. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks. And I appreciate the discussion. What I would suggest to the board is that if that's something that um, is a we need to consider next uh, next spring would be when we get ready to think about the More new of school a phase year. Out possibly. Yeah, that, that, okay. those are the kinds of things that we need okay. to need to consider. Okay. So, but questions are good. Appreciate the clarification, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to consent item G, and that's enclosure. Uh, that is the board membership dues. Um, yes, I'm looking more specific. For actually, first of all, the KASA membership. Who's all on that? Just you and Miss Six for dues. Or is that principals and 
so uh, princ principals may be part of that uh, may also be uh, members and if that if so that would that would come from their individual school uh, accounts monies are out so this is from the district it'd yes. be UMS 6 yes yes sir all right they're, they I don't think they're around there. Um, are they done at a different time I guess all right Now, I have a question for you. On KSBA, do KDE requires KSBA for us to do our classes we have to do by state law? Goes to KSBA. Do I have to be a member of KSBA to take those classes? Or do you even know? I tried calling them, but I can't get an answer. I, yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know the 100% answer, but I suspect that to take those classes courses with KSBA um, they it's a board membership it so then that also reaches out to each individual board member if um, so I, that's that's the structure that's how we've allowed so that's right. I'm just trying to see ways to save money sure I, so I will so bring this eight thousand dollars uh, they are the official record keeper of all the training for the boards in the state of Kentucky so if they don't have your name on there as one of our board members well, I understand that but KDE gives them money so that I just want that clarified that's all right um, my other thing is I see the dues for OVAC are 15,000 approximately for 2024 and 2023 according to their financial report it, we Paid them around twenty-five thousand. Did our dues come down, or do we have another payment coming up? No, that's a great question. So our uh, that's correct. And last year, our dues to OBEC was twenty-five thousand dollars for our, that's membership for our district to belong. Uh, they have reduced that membership fee for, and that's based upon enrollment of number of students per district. So they've reduced that to fifteen thousand dollars. So there will not be another uh, a fee coming our way. The other thing I'd point out is that as a result of that, talking about return on investment, the um, as a result of having being a member there, we have received about three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in grants from them that supports our student, our teacher fellows uh, to be able to support student learning, and then that also is supporting uh, counseling at two of our schools to pay for counselors over the next five years. So, uh, for uh, members, just that alone is a is a heck of a return. On our board's investment, our district investment. Do we have people that hunt grants within our own county? We have we have some staff that help support grants. But the the biggest issue that we have as a school district is our district is not always eligible for those grants because they are federal, and most federal grants are based upon um, your demographics within your county, and so that is an issue for us for eligibility. Um, and, but if there are grants that are out there so the co-op will help support that work or be able to provide opportunities for that uh, right. so it's a great resource and rw baird is is he the owner of baird financial or part of it I, or just same last name dr shelton do you know the answer to that question Is there a gentleman that goes to the meetings named R.W. Baird, according to the minutes? To which meeting? Go back meeting. Uh, not that I'm. It could be, but I'm not. I'm not uh, sure. There, there are a lot of people that attend those the uh, OVAC meetings. Would you let me know if the there is? Sure. Because I'm curious of relationship since we're switching to their company, and I, I saw it on the minutes. I sure. had, had concerns. I'm not. About I'm that. not aware of that. All right. Try to lobby. Um, so you'll have, uh, like, for example, with fiscal agents, they may or may not all be there. You know, there are three firms that we know that all fair, and one or more of those usually at different co op meetings. They also have, you know, other 
types of vendors who want but they they're just sitting in the audience. Um, I just want to let it known, I can't vote yes for it. I don't like how OVAC came in, or a vote came in in January, I think it was January 21, 22, January 22, where I believe it was uh, Mr. Gravis took some slides out. Um, he said so at the meeting on tape, and all the slides were about DEI infused instructional strategy. You go to OVEC's website, um, there's a ton on it. I saw your response to the meeting about when Ms. Hunley asked you about it. Um, but when, you know, I look at, I trust what you're saying with Gates, PDP, um, and EL, how we de kind of decentralize it basically, making it available. But then I look on their website and it says equity will be continue to be a central focus of all OVEC districts. So are we bringing down people to bring up people? I don't know. I look at it and it brings concern to me. Um, it is critical to transform theory into classroom application about DEI plus B now. This is all on their website. Um, I just have concerns about it, and I don't like when it was brought to that meeting how slides were taken out. Um, I know we get so much from them, but then once again, nothing is free. So with those concerns, I just want to say why I'm voting no for the membership's dues for OVEC. Plus their contracts are not in our behalf if you read them. It's all about protection of OVAC and U of L and not our district. So, yeah. So, uh, Mr. Dennis, I appreciate that the um, uh, work that you're discussing, if I remember correctly, from last January, was an initiative facilitated by the University of Louisville, which is its own, obviously, its own entity, not part of OVAC. Um, and they had, and certainly there was discussion at that time about from the board about. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I understand that. And um, I don't remember uh, all the details about that, but I understand. I remember that taking place. That's something that any recommendation that I make to the board, and part of what I also as a, uh, for our board is that I, I attend those meetings regularly and consistently, and really try to pay very close attention to anything I would bring to the board as to what our district is ready for, and what our students and what our staff might need. Uh, try to be very very uh, mindful and, and try to really, really, really guard that. If it's not something that's going to benefit us or support us, uh, then that's not something I would ever, ever recommend. I do appreciate your concern and appreciate your voice in that. And we, we're a long-term member of that. How long? I mean, uh, decades? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. And just to clarify what you mentioned, what Joe mentioned about the slides that were taken mm -hmm. out. That, that is not what we're voting on tonight. That correct. is something different. That was that was correct. Thank you, Ms. Clem. That is a, that was a particular program that OVEC uh, was had offered that you have <coughs> worked through OVEC to provide. So that that's not part of our membership dues. So we're not getting that service if we approve that contract. That's not. So really, the membership is for us to be members to benefit from things that services that we would support. Um, and that if there were other things, there are other contracts or opportunities, then I would bring that to the board for recommendation uh, to consider. Such as those two grants, those grants were approved by the Board of Education. That was not as a result of being members, if that makes sense. So we're voting to be a member to have access to these programs. That's but correct. we have the power later to say we don't want those programs. Or a particular contract, if I should bring something to you. I would, okay. I would not present something or recommend something to the board that I thought would not aligned to our values. Okay. And I've talked to a lot of teachers um, who say that they bring a lot of really good professional development to the table, um, especially, especially in regards to special ed and preschool. And um, so that would be, you know, why I would vote for that. And the only reason I had even uh, uh, allowed them to present or present on that topic even last January is really trying to. Uh, turn over every rock to help support teacher recruitment and induction, 
not to, but I can understand about there being concern. And while there's concern, I understand that. But I think just for the full Okay, your recommendation, sir? Recommend to approve. Councilor Bailey? Can I get a motion to approve item G on the consent agenda? Made by Mrs. Clem, seconded by Mr. Dotson. All those in favor? All those opposed? And it passes four to one. Next, sir, we have your superintendent reports. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to invite Dr. Shelton uh, to come uh, back to the podium and present the unaudited financial report to the board. And Dr. Shelton, before you get started, I just want to remind the board that, uh, and our board members, you'll find this report in the action items, um, just as uh, for reference as Dr. Shelton's discussing. The, uh, <clears throat> as you know, um, our fiscal year ends uh, on June 30th. So on June 30th of 2023, our fiscal year ends and we are um, required by uh, state statute to complete an annual financial report that is submitted to the Department of Education. Um, th this report has been completed and it has been submitted. However, um, as uh, it was referred to, this is what we call the unaudited report uh, because ultimately we will bring you an audited report after the audit is complete in the fall. Um, and so there will be additional adjustments and corrections. However, um, I'm very pleased to present this report to you today. Um, it's very good news. We have uh, ended the year with a really strong general fund balance. Um, as you can see highlighted there on the enclosure, uh, just over $24.3 million ba balance. You have our revenues and expenses noted there. Um, we had uh, revenues of uh, in the general fund of 100.6 million as compared to our 98 million dollar budget, and we had expenses of 94.6 million as compared to our 100 million dollar uh, budget. So um, that's what is reflected um, in the the bulk of the report. I did want to highlight and make sure to mention that uh, there is an accounting adjustment that is made. Um, on uh, our annual financial reports, it's um, to do with what's called GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, which I know you don't want to hear about. Um, but we have to record the revenues uh, that are contributed on our behalf by the state and the related expenses that go against that. For example, uh, the health insurance that's paid at the state level, the retirement that's paid at the state level, et cetera. So um, this report does not reflect that because uh, that is not anything within our control and it's not anything that um, is reported on to you on a regular basis, but it is net of those expenditures. I also wanted to highlight that we had uh, made the adjustments um, previously based on the completion of the fiscal year 22 audit um, to our uh, previous financial reporting and we've uh, adjusted that uh, through the beginning balance of uh, this report. So that allowed us to have an ending contingency balance of just over $16 million. I want to uh, briefly explain the difference between contingency and fund balance without again rolling your eyes or boring anyone. But uh, a fund balance um, is a little bit of a misnomer um, for those who are used to dealing with business and industry. A fund balance is simply the dis difference between your assets and your liabilities. So if you look at the total amount of what you own, your cash, your assets, and what you own, and you subtract what you owe, that's what the word when we refer to fund balance. Contingency is uh, the amount of savings that we have that uh, at the state level you may re hear referred to as a rainy day fund. When you talk about the state level, you may hear it uh, listed as a surplus. Those are the funds that we have available, actually available to the district. So we are at 16 million or just right at 16% of our budget. Have um, other fund balances uh, that are significant that are listed there for you at the end. Um, and then um, you have a copy of the full report. 
As I mentioned, uh, we will update this report um, and work with our auditors. Our audit is uh, scheduled to begin on August the 21st and uh, we're looking forward to working with our new auditors. One of the things that I uh, specifically wanted to mention referring to your earlier conversation um, is I'm preparing some financial analysis for Dr. Radford to share with you uh, for the August meeting and uh, it's, it will be based on how where we ended up this year uh, in order for me to be able to uh, speak to you on what I would recommend moving forward financially. But one thing that I think is always um, worthy of notice is um, how uh, school districts spend their money. And when you look at general fund expenditures, uh, we spend 80% of our general fund budget on salaries and benefits. And that's right in line with what any other district does. Um, it's generally 80 to 85%. Some districts are higher than that. Um, when you look at the other re required uh, services such as maintenance and transportation and you look at the other required supplies and um, uh, materials that are allocated out to our schools, um, the total of all of that is 94 percent. So when we look at um, our budget, we really only have uh, 6 percent of our budget that has any discretion um, over it uh, for the other type of expenditures. And that's the reason why we spend so much time looking at a revenue forecast. That's why we'll spend a long a period of time discussing our uh, tax rates that I would recommend to you based on where we ended this year and also look at uh, what the state allocation through SEEK will be. So this will be the basis. Uh, of the conversations we have moving through the month of August. So I hope you have time not only just for tonight to review it, but to continue to review it. Um, and I'll provide you additional information through Dr. Radford as we get ready for the August meeting. But I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. You said transportation. What percentage do you think that is? Well, transportation, again, this is, a, I've taken salaries and benefits out because I'm saying if you look by types of expenditures. Um, so transportation is about 4%, maintenance is about 5%. Um, that's, again, excluding the salaries of the people in those departments. That's just the run for the materials and the parts and the supplies uh, and the gas. Well, uh, more diesel, excuse me, for transportation. Other questions? If we could get the state to do their part with the transportation, how much more money would that give us? So that's a great question. Um, I'll try not to get on my soapbox about that one, Mr. Dodson. Um, and what do they currently fund? So uh, I'll give you a little historical perspective on that because, uh, as you all know, I've been around a long time. Um, so I'm from one of those few people who remember when the state used to fully fund transportation. Uh, you don't find too many of us around anymore because that is what is intended uh, from the original CARA lawsuit and uh, that's what is listed in the regulation is that is a reimbursement of an expense. It's not meant to be an allocation from the general fund state budget. And so I remember when it was 100%. Over time it eroded. Uh, and it got down as low as 58 percent. Um, and so districts are required to provide transportation to any student living more than a mile from school. Uh, it's an equity issue allowing kids to get to and from school. Uh, and so the state requires that. They had always funded it, but it dropped as low as 58. We're now back up to somewhere approximately 70 percent, uh, but we still have a long way to go. What kills me is they pick and choose what part of care they want to fund. They want to fund SEEK, but they don't want to fund transportation. We used to call that, Mr. Dotson, we used to call the transportation cut back in my days as superintendent. We used to call that the below the line cut because nobody saw it but school districts. Uh, you, you see SEEK because it's, it's the amount that's allocated per pupil. Transportation is a separate funding formula that's that's distributed differently, and uh, you know they'll they'll have a district report the total transportation expense that's called unprorated transportation. 
but then when you get your actual funding from the state you'll have a prorated amount of that that you actually get and again it's been as low as uh, 58 percent so funded. dr sheldon what is that 30 percent that we don't get how much money is that for our district well I'll, i'm going to refer you actually just because i want you to be able to see this uh, let me get you to the right page here If you'll flip to in in the financial report or on your screen, go to on uh, the financial report that's attached there to page eight um, of the annual financial report. You'll see the the total cost of transportation, which is um, seven and a half million dollars, and that again that does include salaries and benefits. Let me be clear that that's the, the total cost of transportation for us and ours is very well managed uh, as you can see mr webb does a, an incredible job and so we actually are at only at 90 percent um, of what we spent compared to what the budget was because the budget was 8.4 million dollars um, but it, it, at 70 percent at reimbursement uh, do my math here that's about 5.2 million so it's about 2.3 million dollars will be short funded this next year because it's always one year lag so tom what would you if you had to estimate <clears throat> i know you said the seven and a half included salary and benefits for transportation people if you had to back their salary and benefits out of that what would you guess we were short what's cl what's closer to the real number uh, I'm not sure I've followed you back in the salaries and benefits out but if you back the salary and benefits out of that is 4.4 million out of the seven and a half so okay. it's it's 3.3 million is what the remainder of our cost is to provide those services is that does that answer yes, okay thank I just you. want to make sure when I was the last time the state was 80 85 percent funded for transportation not a hundred when was the last time it was higher than 70 ah uh, I'm trying to remember when I uh, 2004 um, 2002 was the year I started as superintendent and 2004 um, from my memory serve was we were still nearly at a hundred percent and it started falling from there and it's gone it's fallen ever since so I'm gonna say mid 2000s 2004 2006 now uh, I will tell you that the Department of Education um, and their education advocacy as well as the other K groups um, that is a line item that comes up every year um, and this coming spring is a legislative session where they'll be setting the uh, biennial budget for the next two years and it is a high priority item to get full funding for transportation as it should be you should be fully funded for services you're provided to get to, um, you're required to, get, to provide dr sheldon could you give us some other examples of items because i know um if i'm not mistaken professional development used to be paid for and reimbursed by the state and that's no longer done either can you Te give us some other items that textbooks safe schools professional development I, I'll pre I could prepare you a list to send to Dr. Radford. I would but. absolutely love to see a list of what used to be funded and is no longer funded by the state. So that's well, good. And, I, and I would tell you, even though um, I completely agree with um, what Mr. Dodson was saying about SEEK, if you listen to what you're being told, uh, there are historic investments that have been made in education and the education funding level in the state is the highest it's ever been. But what I would tell you is, is that we have not been fully funded for education since prior to 2008 and there's plenty of reports out there to document that um, it's the funding is not kept up in the seat base in 2008 the great recession the seat base stepped backwards and it's never caught up since so basically between now and the session we need to be getting hold of our representatives and saying hey you don't need to fund transportation well, they need they need to fund transportation the other thing that that i would encourage you and and again i can get a list of these type things uh to dr radford for you is that um another thing that happened is you know we're, we're currently getting funding for full day kindergarten which we've been providing for a good while in the district you, those of you who've been around a while may remember we used to only get 
fifty percent funding uh, because it was based on half day kindergarten. So last year, uh, the last two years, um, it was added into budget language to fund full day kindergarten, but it's not been built into statute, so it could go away at any given time. So we we want to advocate for at least to be in the budget funding for a full day kindergarten but we would also want to advocate for it to actually be moved into statute to where it's required to be funded. You all are getting me on my favorite topic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dr. Radford knows this is my favorite long-term topic to discuss. And Dr. Shelton, appreciate you sharing this in this report. I'd share with the board last year I estimated if we uh, got 100% funding for transportation, as Dr. Shelton just kindly talked about it, the difference, if that we are currently uh, 68, 70 percent, if we've got to 100 percent, that's a, about, estimates about two to 2.5 million dollars. Uh, and when we look at giving raises to staff, those are reoccurring funds. So we have to make sure that we can sustain that and not overextend. Um, and as Dr. Shelton talked about, rainy day funds, uh, every district required to have that and you want to make sure that you have, that you are, um, that we're uh, in really good, good, good place. Uh, we do not, no school district or organization should ever use their savings account to pay the mortgage. And that is what we have to be very mindful of while at the same time addressing needs and staying and being good stewards of taxpayer dollars, which I think is one of the things that uh, each of our board members have really touched on tonight with some of the questions and I appreciate that. Board members, any other questions? I, I should point out one other thing, uh, if I could, um, that I mentioned what our revenues and expenses um, were there, budget versus actual, uh, but I didn't explain um, the variances there that are listed, and I wanted to mention that to you real qu quickly, is that you see uh, revenues, we are 2.6% over budget, which is what you always want, right? You always want to budget conservatively, and you always want your revenues to come in higher than what you actually budget. You don't ever want to, I don't ever want to come back to Dr. Radford and say, I'm sorry, we over budgeted revenues and we're, we're, we're not getting all the money we need. So we were uh, over by 2.6%. Um, and then expenses, we were under by 5.6% what was budgeted, which you also always want. You always want to budget to spend more than you actually do, so you have a little bit of uh, slack, so to speak, in your budget. Um, so I wanted to highlight those two variances. We were under budget in expenses and over budget in revenues. And Dr. Shelley, could you touch on the, um, uh, in FY20, what you're reporting on is FY22 AFR. And 23. I'm sorry, 23 right. and 22, sorry my years. Um, uh, Salaries and benefits we've we've reduced you reported tonight where can you touch on that and the significance of where, so, where we were and where we are? So as you you all know I started with you in January and one of the first things um, That dr. Edford asked me to do was do an analysis of where we were at that particular point and First thing I asked him to let me do was to work with our auditors to complete the fiscal year 22 audit as we did um, in Fiscal year 22, we had budgeted to spend 84% um, of our budget um, on salaries and benefits, and we actually came out at 82, which is which is a good variance, but is very reflective of the uh, changes and um, the the different policies and uh, structures that have been put in place here uh, in the last two years. And then this past year, fiscal year 23. We budgeted 82% for salaries and benefits, and we actually came in at 80%. So um, in the last two years, there's been a 4% reduction while the raise and the step that were mentioned earlier were both given. Um, and so um, that that's significant because uh, when you're looking at a budget that has so little discretionary expenditures in it, um, you can really kind of do one of two things. You can, you know, increase revenue or you can, you know, decrease expenses if you're trying to increase salaries. And 
the we've been able to increase salaries while decreasing the uh, overall cost to the district which is significant So it sounds like we have a little wiggle room on those teacher raises. Um, the only thing that I would caution you, I, I don't disagree with that statement, but the only thing I would caution you is until I get to finish is, is that we know we've been funded from the state based on 2018-19 um, average daily attendance. That's been held constant through the pandemic. Uh, we know, now know we're going back to being funded on actual um, average daily attendance uh, and as Michael would tell you we have lost enrollment and lost percentage of attendance uh, which will reduce our state funding uh, so we have to look at what our uh, local tax revenue will be in order to offset any loss in state funding um, we will be receiving a, a certified assessment from the state that will show us the total property values for the state and will give us the option of what tax rates to recommend to you and I'll bring all of that to you in August. Is some of that cost savings from COVID money, ESSER funds, or is that just general fund budget This is money? just general fund, right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I separated completely. The ESSER funds are in fund two. Uh, the special revenue fund. Good deal. Board members, any other questions? Dr. Redford, any other comments? Dr. Shelton, thank you for your uh, work and diligence on this and really appreciate the report. Thank you. And definitely want that list, Dr. Shelton. <laughs> thank you. Next, sir. Yes. Please. Yes, I'd like to invite Ms. Six and Ms. Dan to come forward and share, uh, uh, I think Ms. Dan's going to present okay. to you all a update about quality instruction, which is some work that our team has been working on uh, to support student learning. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Um, this work has been really um, been in the formation for at least the last actually a couple years. Um, the literacy coaches kind of started with the first draft. The literacy work group started this fall, kind of took it, that draft and we really talked about what is it that we wanted for our K-5 learners in the area of literacy that despite whatever program we were using, that we would guarantee that these are the things that we would teach our students. And likewise, we would train our teachers to have the greatest amount of content knowledge possible to uh, make these things come to life um, which is really what our world-class um, literacy vision is so um, this has kind of gone through multiple drafts but um, you can see that we strive to equip students with knowledge and skills to be independent readers and writers thinkers and communicators while fostering a love and a value for literacy um, of course, we plan to use evidence-based practices and materials. Uh, we would differentiate instruction. We all know that every child within our classroom is very different as a reader and maybe you know, and as a writer, or even in the way that they communicate. Um, but all while meeting the uh, Kentucky academic standards. And so when you're thinking about standards, I always explain that that's like the blueprint of the house. When you're going to build a house, you have to, you know, meet the building right like this is what you have to have this is what the floor plan this is the base and then you can build curriculum around that to be robust and you do want meaningful topics and things for kids to engage and think about um, and so we um, included in that we would want uh, phonological awareness and phonemic awareness we would want uh, phonics instruction in oral written language, vocabulary, and word study, uh, reading fluency, comprehension, um, and we could develop all those things in an authentic read aloud, and then of course written composition being another critical component. Um, the bottom part below is the evidence-based instructional practices and strategies that we currently use and will continue to provide professional learning around. and that will kind of be the basis for when we do 
adopt curriculum resources that we look at those so we would look at those through the lens of this kind of placemat is what we're referring to it as any questions so one of the things that I appreciate that Ms. Dan, your report on this and the work that the entire uh, team work group has worked on, the quality literacy instruction should always be the, as Ms. Dan mentioned, the placemat to help us drive decisions when we talk about professional learning, when we talk about pinpointing what a student might need because the moves that a teacher needs to make if Ms. Dan and uh, Mr. Radford cannot read very well, the moves that the, a teacher uh, Mr. Bohannon might need to make are very, very different. So that's a skill and that is an art to be able to master in order for that student to be proficient. So this is gives us a, uh, a placemat to work from in terms of quality literacy instruction. So thank you. Yes, teaching, teaching reading and, and writing is very complex. Um, children progress at different times, but you know, quality instruction still is quality instruction with these um, core things um, at the foundation. Board members, questions? Thank you, Ms. Dan. Mm -hmm. Next, sir. Yes, ma'am. So the, um, as has been presented to the board and posted on our website, uh, that we've had discussions, the KSBA draft manual is available uh, for the entire community to review. And so my recommendation is just to take this report under advisement and we will, this will actually be the um, first reading. And so then the second reading would be in August. Therefore, after that, we would um, uh, begin a schedule and I'll present that schedule in August to the board that we would look at each chapter and, put, and then customize and then come back to the board to be able to um, make recommendations so that way it, it aligns with our um, systems and processes that we have in place and then could have and what what I will do is ask each department to review and then re make recommendations that I can bring to the board so that's that is and that's outlined there in the enclosure questions board members policies that need to be changed do you want us to just email you that like next week or do you want us to just put the amendment at the meeting in ones that I suggest or staff may be violating policy that we don't want I think Mm -hmm. I think, Mr. Dennis, I think if you have uh, some suggestions on um, policies, especially as we're, like this manual as an example, go ahead and send those to me. Uh, and then I think then that way I can share that with each department respectively when we get to the schedule that we put together when we review so I can, and so that I can bring that to the board and have, have some further discussion. All right. What, I, what I'm saying is there, there are some policies that you're going to implement that aren't right like the SRO policy we and I'll, I'll email you but before I can approve the policies we put in effect there are certain policies I think may need to be changed before we vote to put them in does that make sense it does it, it does so, I, so is there a way to amend or I could suggest sort of policies I think need to be fixed <laughs> Uh, so. Yes, I think I think definitely you can make those suggestions and recommendations, and then that's something that the board can then vote on in terms of approving those policies, um, and um, be happy to, happy to do that. But please send that to me. All right, I would send it to him and copy us, right. just so. Any other questions, board members? Okay, next. Yes, I'd like to invite Mr. Brent Bohannon to come forward and give the board a construction update. Mr. Bohannon, welcome. Brent, thank you for all the pictures in your presentation. Yeah, I actually was going to apologize about that. The, uh, in the past week or so, uh, 
some of these pictures have become unrecognizable. <laughs> so uh, as we go as we go through your report here, uh, I'll try to give you the most current update, um, um, as opposed to where we were sitting uh, at the beginning of last week when we submitted the report. Um, Odom County Foundation uh, repairs roof project phase three. The uh, roof replacement on the gym is about 80% complete with the I'd say about 90% complete as of today with the tear off. About 80% complete with the um, with the the new, the new roof put back, um, and they're making pretty good progress on that. Um, as we know, the weather has not been cooperating with us this month, but um, the past couple days, um, they've been able to really make some progress up there. We did run into a snag up there with um, one portion of the roof that's going to require a little bit of a um, reworking of the um, of the the base roof on that. So um, we're kind of coming up with a contingency plan with um, with Ms. With, uh, Ms. Brown, and um, in case we run into more issues there. But we think that we met with the structural engineer earlier today, and I think we've got that um, worked through. So we're still shooting for uh, being able to uh, have that open uh, back to full use on the first day as the work continues on the uh, exterior walls as well. But um, I will keep you all posted on that. Um, I'm going to fly through. You feel free to stop me if you all need to on any of the other ones. Uh, South Autumn High School Fieldhouse renovation is a closeout documentation. South Autumn High School uh, fire alarm upgrades. That work is ne uh, nearly complete. ADT is tying that uh, monitoring system in at the end of last week, and their um, Corson is uh, finishing up punch, punch type work, uh, painting out cover plates and stuff like that at this at this stage. Um, East Middle Edition, that's a closeout pro uh, process there. Athletic Stadium and Field Improvements. The uh, bid package A is a closeout document for the uh, South Odom Field Lighting. Bid package B, the Odom County Ticket Booth, Footings Foundations Complete, Electrical Rough Ends Complete. Um, as you all can see out there as you're driving in, the brickwork is complete and the roof structure is installed and the entrance canopy for both the home and visitor side on, that kind of flank the ticket booth is installed. We're running into a little bit of delay on the metal roof on the top of that, but it is weather tight and they're continuing with the um, interior finishes on that. Uh, South Odom concession stand, rock removal is complete, uh, concrete foundation walls on the hillside um, are complete and the uh, Foundation drilling for the scoreboard um, is complete. They've moved that rig off site now, and that steel should be going up for that shortly, if it hasn't already today. Uh, South Autumn High School ticket booth, the uh, uh, masonry block is complete, the brickwork is complete, and the roof trusses have been installed and are being um, damp proofed currently. The turf replacement project, bid package C, um, as you may have seen driving in on that as well. Uh, Oldham County High School, the, um, the turf is installed. The um, details of that turf are being stitched in currently as far as the uh, field markings for um, all of the sports as well as the um, um, center field markings and the letterings in the end zone. Um, that work should be complete within the next day or so. And then I think by Wednesday they said they should start brooming in the, um, the rubber infill. Try not to say turf dirt. Um, over at North Oldham High School, the top rock has been installed. The drainage, all of the drainage is complete, and they finished up doing the uh, concrete work for the jump pits um, for the field events on that. The manufacturer of the um, the shock absorbent cushion on that project um, ran into a manufacturing issue with that. Um, I actually just heard of it this morning or this afternoon before I came over here so we are going to do a late shift of the manufacturer and um, so that we can kind of keep us close to our timeline on that and so we should have that back on site instead of September with the previous manufacturer next week so um, we did a little bit of uh, pivot there and so that we can keep moving and that turf should follow behind that um, I think that the 13th is the scheduled delivery date for that turf um, and then I've, on your report there, I've kind of summarized those dates a little bit and identified where, we, where we've run into uh, some delays with manufacturing and where we expect delays moving forward. And then also projected out the, uh, the other track and stadium improvements uh, um, into this year that will, um, that will continue on after the uh, fall sports season starts. Uh, Oldham County Buckner Elementary Boiler Replacement. Um, 
All of that has been completed and the coordination with the uh, Buckner Mechanical Room upgrades is probably about 95% complete. <coughs> um, Odom County Preschool expansion, the uh, board approved the DDs for that today for the roof replacement and expansion of that. And we will come to you in August with the CDs um, to bid that in the fall. Buckner Mechanical Rooms, I just discussed that one as well. The district wide landscape and site improvement project, the design team was selected and the board approved that earlier this month. No proceed has been sent to the design team and they're uh, working to get us the uh, signed contracts back to us, the B101s. Um, in the meantime, interior uh, in-house landscaping and site improvements um, continue. Oldham County High School HVAC upgrades, that system is back up and running as of Wednesday uh, last week. The, uh, the completion of that project um, is probably about 95% probably about with that. They've got some painting and some um, insulating of uh, pipes to do in that mechanical room. But as far as the building function, um, they are back up and running. North Oldham High School soffit and roof metal repairs. We had a recommendation to, um, to rebid that in the fall, reject that bid and uh, re re revise the scope and rebid that. Um, we've noticed with the, ca the past couple bids um, that We've, that we've had that um, we're not in a very favorable bidding environment right now. Um, and it's been that way, it's been going that direction for quite some time, but in the last month or so, it's um, gotten to the point where um, we're going to kind of reevaluate the timing on when we bid things. Um, there's just, every contractor's covered up right now. Um, everybody who was potentially going to bid summer work has their summer work. Um, so we're gonna kind of let the summer season go through and once school starts, we're gonna rebid some of these projects so that they can start preparing for what they're doing in the, the next the next season and into the next year. So you'll see some uh, two of these projects come back around here in the um, probably in September um, for those rebids. Is part of that, Brent, because of the KDE and because are some of those contractors, they've been snagged up by other school districts since the, I would say that their money? I would say that any reason that you could think of is a valid reason. I mean, we have uh, worker shortages, we have construction trades that are uh, short on staffing, and we have projects going on, not just locally, but you know, around the state around and, na and nationally that are eating up uh, as the, the materials. So we have material shortages, delays, and then you know, we also told everybody to take a couple years off, a couple years back, and we're still feeling the uh, repercussions of that um, when it comes from the, uh, the manufacturer side of production. Uh, and now, I'll just take example for the turf, for example. Um, now everybody in the state's doing turf projects, and we're all looking for the same manufacturers to be producing the same product at the same time. So uh, it's, a, it's a tight walk with uh, trying to get the products in. And we're seeing it's weird projects and there's no rhyme or reason to it. I know that you and I have talked about like toilet partitions were hard to get last month for some reason. Um, and then uh, metal products are still a little bit difficult to time with the sequence of construction. So you'll see some, some of our construction will get to a certain point point. it'll look like it's sitting there um, for, some, for some period of time waiting for the metal roof to be put on, for example. Um, and then also uh, any, a lot of uh, like the shade structure of the canopy. It's a manufactured metal product. This just takes a lot of time to actually get from the manufacturer. Once we get it, it doesn't take that long to install as long as we have the bodies available to do it. So I would say all of those are uh, making it a not very favorable bid environment. Um, and there is so much work out there that contractors can kind of pick and choose what jobs they want to go after. Um, and if the, um, if the market's not right for them, then they're not going after the, the smaller jobs or they're not going after jobs that uh, then maybe there's not such a, a margin uh, for profit for them. So you'll see a lot of the private um, jobs are doing just fine. Uh, a lot of the public work is maybe uh, falling a little bit behind. Um, and then, the, you know, there's also some, um, some pretty big state projects that are going on regionally. Um, they're eating up a lot of electrical panels. For example, um, electrical panels are very hard to get right now. Um, we ordered an electric panel in April and they're scheduling it to be delivered in January. Wow. And that's just a 480 volt panel. There's nothing fancy about it. It's just should be, previously it was an off the shelf item. So. Um, Thank you for the explanation. Yeah. Let's see, where was I here? Number 12, um, 
Odom County Middle School Career Tech Renovation. That's one of the projects that I was just speaking of that we'll rebid. Um, South Odom Middle School Career Tech Addition um, will be following right behind that uh, process, that one being more of an addition instead of the building renovation uh, of the metal building out here on uh, Colonel's Drive. So um, that one will be about a month or two behind that so that we can time that with the school season because that will affect um, egress from the building in some parts. So we'll have to coordinate that with the school schedule a little bit. Site accessibility at various elementary schools. Um, center field concrete sidewalks installed. The play surface on the left side, if, you're, if your back is to the school, has been completed and we are scheduled to review that with the uh, manufacturer this upcoming week. The playground equipment um, that the school purchased has been installed on the right side of the playground and that surface, uh, if it didn't start today, should start tomorrow to be installed. The uh, landscape seating wall and retaining wall um, is nearing completing is nearing completed and needs to be um, slacking seed and, saw, seed and straw. And the pavers at the lower level of that um, started to install uh, at the end of last week or first of this week, if if not Friday. Kenwood Elementary School. The uh, the board approved the um, the change order tonight for the removal of that playground equipment so that um, we can install a, a new playground. Uh, set up with that uh, resurface that the board's doing. Um, the retaining wall has been complete. The uh, fencing has been complete. And I think as of today, the, the remaining concrete work out there has been completed and um, is at grade with the irrigation already installed um, at that point. So we're going to be in a little bit of a holding pattern for that for the um, playground equipment itself. Um, we do already have the layouts uh, for it, um, and we'll just as soon as that equipment gets here, um, it will be installed, and then the play surface will be completed after that. Um, early fall, I think, is what we're looking at for that one. Buckner, uh, the rough grading's complete there. The curbs have been completed. Um, the mulch has been placed, and they have, um, as of Friday, they had the tack strips in, and they should be starting to turf that. Uh, very very soon, if not today. Hadn't made, hadn't made my way up the hill yet there today. Uh, Camden Station, the uh, mobilization started. The, ins the installation of the, um, the anchor bolts is being completed for the foundations for that, and the slab uh, work will start on that this week. Um, and then, like I said, we, we anticipate the canopy structure for that to be delivered on the 28th of August. So we've got a little bit of a delay getting that from the manufacturer. Um, there should be, I think we talked about, there was concern a little bit about restrictions on the playgrounds. Um, Camden, I think we're gonna be okay. We're just gonna, there's just gonna be a concrete pad out there until the structure gets there. Um, Buckner, I'm, we're pushing and I'm thinking that we might be okay there. Um, Kenwood is, uh, like I said, we're gonna be waiting on that playground equipment, but once that's installed, then we'll get that back up and operational. Um, you know, after probably the first couple of weeks of school, I'm hoping. Um, and then center field, we're going to be kind of down to the wire with with that one as far as the uh, the um, landscaping, finishing up those those that process. So it may be there by day one. It may be day three that it gets done. Okay. Uh, field two renovations, Odom County High School, North Odom High School. Uh, the uh, the board approved DDS for those tonight. Or, I'm sorry, in July. And um, we're moving forward with CDs for those in August, and then with the intent of bidding that out after the fall season. Um, South Odom High School shop renovation, welding shop, and then the main lobby restroom corridor uh, renovations. Demolition is complete in the restrooms and corridors. Painting is complete in the corridor. Uh, ceiling installation is nearing complete, if not complete today. Um, the restroom work is ongoing. We're um, like I said earlier, it's been interesting. A little bit of delay with toilet partitions, but I think we're going to be okay with that one, um, as of what I'm hearing today. Um, in the welding shop, the demolition is complete. Electrical rough in um, above ceiling is complete. The wall patching is complete. Core drilling for the new water lines and rough ends is complete. Spray on acoustical ceiling has been installed and complete, and the painting is nearing complete by this point in time. We should start to see equipment showing up for that lab um, this week. And then the central office interior renovations and site improvements. Um, that project is, uh, we've got we have BG2 and BG3 approval in June. Um, we've had some discussions about some um, 
some logistics with that project. So I'm going to come back to the board with a um, with a little more detail of, of what we're looking to uh, to make that project possible and what it entails on that end, and then also the potential for uh, for expanding that project to uh, to increase our footprint a little bit there. Let's see. Okay, on to the minor projects. Actually, let me just ask. Let me just stop there and ask if there's any questions. Because some of these are repeats from last month. Board members, any questions? I got a couple questions. Uh, will the football fields be ready for their first game? The uh, Odom County High School should be ready for their first home game. Okay. Um, North Odom High School's uh, first game, we had um, our finding arrangements for that one. We weren't going to be complete with that one with the, uh, the special turf that was ordered for that. Our earliest uh, delivery date, even at the beginning of the project, was August 13th on that. So uh, I'm hoping that we can improve it by a week or so. Um, but by the time their second home game comes around, by the time their first home game, their second uh, originally scheduled home game comes around, it will be ready for them. Okay, that's good. Second question. Uh, I know we're not that far yet. I should say weather permitting before I say uh, any of those things. <laughs> I know we're not that far yet, but just talking about the call, the materials, getting it in, the contractors, how much lead time when we think about starting the art center mm -hmm. will it take to get it? On the longest the lead time I'm experiencing right now is that like those electrical panels. That's um, that, and last year what we were experiencing with mechanical equipment, um, that's kind of corrected itself a little bit now. Um, Anything that had any type of computer chip in it, you know, as far as the uh, control systems and stuff like that, was was uh, 24, 30, 40 week lead times last year for mechanical equipment. Now we're seeing it more on the electrical side of things. So um, what we've, what we're anticipating that we're going to have to do is when we design these projects, we're going to have to design them with the intent of awarding the contract with enough time to build that lead time into the front end of the contract so that when construction gets going, products are, are kind of being stockpiled at that point in time. So, I mean, I can't give you an, uh, an honest timeline. Like the biggest lead times, like, like I said right now, if we ordered an electric panel in April and it's coming in January, I don't know how you plan for that. So what we're doing is just trying to back load the, uh, or front load the submittal process once the design or the contract has been awarded, design's complete, contract's bid out and awarded, um, we're trying to build in staging time for that so that they can start you know, bringing out their connexes, their shipping containers, and then as materials start to arrive, start loading those things up so that when school gets out the next break or when the work is uh, supposed to start, that we've kind of got them on hand, stockpiled, ready to go. I'm just planning ahead, that's why I'm asking. Yes, sir. Thank Mr. You. Dodson would like you to go ahead and order that electrical panel yeah. now. I'll go ahead now. and order like four or five of them just in <laughs> case. <laughs> order them now. Yeah. Any other questions? I have one quick one. Yes, sir. Um, a resident asked me, they looked over your BG for central office and asked what the 200000 would entail for the furniture, not furniture, I forget how. Modular furniture? Well, it, it's... I, I wrote it down, but I can't figure out where I wrote it. If you want to, uh, if you want to shoot to me, I'll break it out. It says two hundred thousand, I think, for furnishings. Do you what is? What it's are, pro it's. Uh, I'll send you a breakdown of what it is where we came up with that number, but it probably includes um, the the modular furniture. So just all as the, well, like your cubicles, cubicle. your uh, your room dividers, your separators, that type of stuff. That, that's all I needed. Okay, thank, thank you. One of the challenges that we have is having confidential meeting space, and we aren't are not able to move or shift those dividers to be able to have space. And uh, from an HR perspective or a finance perspective, and so that's um, that's a big big part of that that cost. Not not to mention the when it rains really hard, the basement floods, and we have to pump water out of the elevator shaft into the toilets in the in, in the lower floor. So uh, HVAC doesn't always work, and so the building looks really good from the from the the road, but it needs some it needs some repair and needs some um, uh, some support to it. No, I I understand that they they were just specific on the furnishings. Mm -hmm. I actually defended 
the position on central office and our investment um, for the building and it is an investment to sure. repair do the HVAC the park lot I understand that yeah, so. and, I, and I appreciate that mr. Dennis I really was adding some additional detail because it's first uh, opportunity probably to really speak to that and so we're trying to our very best to be very um, one of the things I think the bigger piece there is any uh, plans that we put in place it also depends upon the bids that we get in some cases we've gotten zero bids in some cases we've gotten bids that are much too high so that we think that we can do better so then we've waited as you've heard mr. Bohannon talk about so appreciate that question and mr. Bohannon thanks for the detail mm -hmm. all right thank you all Do you want to run through minor projects or no? <laughs> Most of those are uh, kind of follow up from last or from earlier last month. I will also say we will come back to the board and share with the board. You've heard this in previous uh, monthly meetings that you've heard field reports on field two for north and for OC, which are our soccer fields. But that will also uh, come back at a later time and discuss improvements to the lower field at South High School, which uh, the reason that is not uh, been presented as a BG1 or um, uh, official approval is because the concession stand and all of that construction needs to finish first so that will lag a little bit behind yes the BG the the work at the lower level of South Oldham High School will likely be included with the um, with the next phase of construction work at the um, at the on the school just because the timing of completion of the uh, concession stand um, and then we can demobilize from that area before we scoot over and tear it up again all right I'm, I'm fired back up here yeah mostly on number one just because we get emails and Facebook comments about it so. okay um, the Liberty asbestos abatement and demolition project is on hold at the time until we get through summer construction season and then we'll revisit a schedule at that point in time. Thank you, sir. Feel free to hold all the emails until after August. Uh, for time capsules. <laughs> and the walk. From and the pavement. Email the pavement. The pavers. Yeah. Yeah. And fences and tree branches and all of it. Yeah. Okay. Rose bushes. Just all this stuff. Uh, flooring replacement at various schools. Uh, North Odom High School we're going to push that uh, 600 wing um, we just ran out of time getting that done this summer so we're gonna push that to fall break for the replacement and that the uh, Goshen Elementary School that was scheduled to begin this week um, I haven't checked on it today but it had not been started as of uh, this weekend so um, I will check back with them and mr. Rodowski had asked me about that today so I will follow up with you as soon as I hear back from a uh, proposal for uh, the replacement of the Odom County um, high school girls locker room floor replacement room 231 um, has been received and we've given them a notice to proceed and that work should take place um, this week as well uh, the Oldham County High School auditorium lighting replacement we've got a request for bid out from the lighting consultant that actually just came back in at the end of last week um, so we have a, um, a portion of that that will require a general electrician as well um, so those two are going to get together and then I'll bring to you um, the next month or so uh, or in August, I will bring to you the um, the package of, of those two contracts, or those two proposals with the uh, recommendation on the contract. Can I, can I back you up one second? Yeah. On OCHS, is that the girls' locker room period? Like, is that the volleyball and the basketball? The basketball has already been done. That was done previously. Okay. And this is to, uh, we, we brought it up to a point, um, and then we moved everything into that side. Now we've moved everything out of the, uh, or they're in the process of moving everything out of the volleyball side, and then we're going to do the same same floor treatment on both sides. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Odom County High School um, sidewalk uh, received pricing for that. Um, we have to do a little bit of um, maneuvering to get that um, to make that an accessible route from the parking lot to the curb cut on this side of baseball. Um, but we think we can do that without having to do uh, ramps just by regrading it a little bit. Uh, so I do have that proposal and um, we are gonna get that scheduled for, um, it, it's probably gonna happen while school's in process uh, at this point in time. But um, what I told uh, Odom County High School is they can use it until we start roping it off and then we'll put it in a sidewalk and then they can use it 72 hours after we get done with it. Um, safety and security at the middle schools. The uh, initial BG1 for that was approved this evening, I think, if not last earlier this month. 
um, Lagrange Elementary School, and that's the um, the installation of the uh, halo sensors at each of the middle schools. Um, the uh, proposal is being revised on that at the request of schools to include some of the other uh, facilities that I guess are troublesome areas. So um, when we have that proposal, it should include those um, as requested by the schools. The Grange Elementary School lower level, um, we're re, uh, reconfiguring those uh, three classrooms or uh, three resource rooms, two resource rooms and FMD room, excuse me, on the lower level. That demo is complete, new walls installed, uh, ceiling grid went in today, electrician should be back tomorrow to hang lights, and um, hopefully by the end of the week we'll have the flooring replaced in that. I appreciate the work on that, Mr. Bohannon, because that, that space is uh, accessed by some of our most vulnerable kids at, uh, at LaGrange Elementary, and uh, that would be a, a great, uh, great for those kids and their staff. Yeah, that was, that was something that we had kind of put on hold when we were talking, uh, talking about doing the addition renovation, so we wanted to go ahead and get that completed while we're uh, talking about New LaGrange. Okay, any other questions? Board members, anything else? All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, public expression is up next, and we are going to take a five minute break. We'll, yeah, just turn to 610. We will take a five minute break and come back at 615 and start with public expression. We are back in session. Mr. Dodson, if you could please read the public expression policy. Okay, the public and news media are permitted to attend all open meetings of the board. No person may be required to give identification in order to attend the meeting. The chairperson may impose conditions upon attendance at a given meeting only if such conditions are required for the maintenance of order. The board as a whole shall have the final decision as to the appropriate of all ru rulings. Each regular meeting shall include a public comment period of at least 15 minutes. Any board rules and policies regarding conduct during board meetings shall apply during the public comment period. Individuals or groups should uh, contact the office of the superintendent prior to the next scheduled meeting in order to be considered for inclusion of the, on the agenda. Persons wishing to address the board must first be recognized by the chairpersons. Person who wish to address an agenda item should seek recognition at the time the board considers the that particular item. Persons who wish to address the board on a non-agenda item concern are asked to, to seek recognition from the chairperson at the presentation, uh, presentation item on the agenda. The chairperson may require the name and address of the speaker. The chairperson may rule on the relevance of the topic to the board's agenda. The chairperson may also establish time limits for speakers that may be required to maintain order and to ensure the expedient conduct of the board's business. The board as a whole shall have the final decision as the appropriateness of the rulings. The board will not take official action on non-agenda items introduced by the public in the meeting at which they are first introduced. Okay, there are 14 people signed up. So board members, what time limit do you wanna put on? Anyone? Four minutes. Four minutes. I'm open to discussion. But three minutes. Four three. minutes. Three. I can go three. Okay. Joe. Okay. Four minutes. Four minutes is your time limit, Mr. Dodson. Will you keep time for me, please? Yes, I will. Okay. First up is Sarah. Ignacio. I apologize if I said that incorrectly. So, um, good evening. My name is Sarah Ignacio, and I'm a parent of two children in the Oldham County School System. So, I'm here to talk about staffing issues, and I appreciate the conversation that you all had earlier. Um, so, I want to start with the vision and mission statement for Oldham County Schools is as follows. All Oldham County students supported by family, community, and schools participate in relevant, engaging, quality learning tasks in safe, well-designed schools guided by highly skilled teachers and visionary leaders. Graduates pursue a life of continuous learning, 
contribute to their community, participate thoughtfully in the American democracy, and compete successfully in the local, national, and international economy. How are you ensuring that the mission and vision of the school district are being met? I have been to school board meetings in recent months and there doesn't seem to be much conversation around the issue of addressing teacher shortages and re retaining teachers. With the staffing shortages of teachers, I would like to know the superintendent and school board's plan to address this problem immediately so that the mission and vision of the district is not lost. How are the newly created administrative positions helping students learn the basic course subjects? I think you have lost sight of the primary stakeholders of Oldham County Schools, the students. I graduated from Oldham County Schools several years ago when Oldham County Public Schools were ranked the highest in the state. This is no longer the case. Moving forward into the new school year, there are several teacher vacancies. My son is a student at Locust Grove Elementary and I received an email that there are teacher shortages prior to the start of the school year. My other son is entering Oldham County High School where there are also teacher shortages. How are you planning to maintain the mission of the school district so that children are guided by highly skilled teachers and visionary leaders? Students are the primary stakeholders of the school district and teacher shortages are not helping to ensure the success of our students so that they will become contributing members of our community with a skill with a skill set and ability to compete successfully in the local, national, and inter international economy, fulfilling the Oldham County Schools vision. I appreciate the teaching staff at Oldham County Schools, and I want to be sure that they are being offered the support and financial means so that we can retain and attract quality, highly skilled teaching staff to ensure the success of our students, the district, and our community. I'm glad to hear your plan to provide a report in August on staffing issues, please show us your plans in writing how you will address teacher shortage issues. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Rosa Johnson Oaks. days until school begins and we have 39 unfilled teaching positions for elementary middle and high school how many teachers resigned last week and left for 50 percent more pay in Jefferson County teaching core subjects via online instruction is unacceptable we already know that the learning losses resulting from online educational instruction during COVID Will students have certified teachers or employees with emergency teaching certificates? Parents express concerns about long-term substitutes last year. How do we expect to have quality substitutes when places like Kroger are paying higher hourly wages? Parents are still waiting for the PTP meeting that was promised before spring break. Goshen's instructional coach slash PTP teacher resigned, and I hear that Harmony will use an aid with an emergency certificate for the STEM class and PTP after that teacher resigned for Jefferson County. The district restructuring created these PTP issues. What is the plan to address teacher vacancies? In addition to the number of unfilled teaching positions, there are also many open positions that are critical to the basic functioning of our school system, such as bus drivers, cafeteria workers, maintenance, etc. There are 208 unfilled online. Instead of focusing on additional district directors and shuffling school administrators, why wasn't our district focusing on these jobs that are truly crucial for operating a school system and making sure that teachers and staff feel valued and earn competitive living wages? Many parents were not aware that a new curriculum is being piloted at Goshen until they received an email last week. Why wasn't district policy providing stakeholder review and comment followed before selecting a program and purchasing materials if this is a quality curriculum and not the least expensive option and most teachers support it, why wasn't the district transparent and forthcoming with all of the information when parents asked? 
Oldham County currently funds 10 SROs to cover 20 school buildings. Last year, Goshen shared an SRO with Harmony two miles away. This SRO sharing required a waiver from the state security marshal. After raising this issue at the last board meeting, the district stated that Goshen will now have a full-time officer. But rather than fund another officer to cover Harmony, that school is now added to the responsibility of the SRO on duty for North, Oldham, Middle, and High. Despite the proximity of these buildings, the district must have recognized a need for another officer, or they would have used the same SRO for all three without requiring a waiver. Several specific threats of violence occurred last year, including a Snapchat post of a firearm that was shared with evidence that the student told others that they were going to bring the weapon to school. 11 days after I expressed my concerns about security gaps at the safety meeting, a man crashed his car into Goshen and gained access to the building where he was apprehended by police. When I questioned SRO funding and staffing at the board meeting, the district responded that we are exceeding minimum standards. Exceeding minimum standards is not enough. Parents want to know that their children are safe at school and that they receive the same level of security as children at every other school. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a little more. Okay, you, you've used your time and Oh, I didn't hear a timer. I'm sorry. Yes. That's Larry said, Larry oh, said okay. time. I'm sorry. I missed sorry. it. Sorry. You're more than welcome to email us with your final thought. Okay. I don't know how long it is, and it's repeatedly, we've, uh, we've extended time repeatedly. Okay. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. I'll share with everybody, and I, I would like other parents to be able to share their thoughts because that's why you're here, to listen. So I don't know why you can't let someone have one more sentence. Because we all agreed on a time. Laura O'Brien. Hello. Um, just, just as a note, last time I had offered up some of my time for another speaker. She could have had some of my time. Um, I don't need the whole four minutes. Um, and it's actually not in your policy that you can't share, so I think we should be allowed to share. Um, but anyway, so my speech is... Uh, so I'll just read that. In the May board meeting, Charlotte Six said that the community would have an opportunity to share feedback before a curriculum was selected at a school. Parents were made to believe that this also applied to curriculums that would be piloted. Unfortunately, parents found out that this wasn't the case. Several schools in Oldham County purchased materials without allowing community feedback first. To make matters worse, the curriculum that was chosen has major issues that need to be addressed. After several EL education units were piloted at Goshen this past year, four out of six grade levels objected to it. The complaints were as follows. It was too slow paced, non-engaging, does not contain strong phonics, is not user friendly, and only for focuses on four units throughout an entire year. And yet, despite these concerns from teachers and zero feedback from parents, the principal committed to piloting the full program this year. In addition to these issues, parents have concerns about the social aspects of it. On EL we EL's website, it clearly states that the purpose of this curriculum goes way beyond teaching our kids to be proficient readers and writers, but it interjects extremely biased opinions and ideologies into the lessons. In the district literacy workshop meeting that took place in February, written under cautions and considerations, the note taker wrote, EL has a human rights theme we'll need to review with parents for input so that it's not to be characterized as woke ideology. What this means is that the district is aware of the concerns with EL and has yet to provide even one public meeting to discuss it, which is actually required by state law. I urge the board and Dr. Radford to follow the law to get stakeholder feedback and allow families and teachers to explore all possible curriculums so that we can find the very best one for our kids. We cannot have a world-class education without world-class curriculum. In addition to speaking about this, I want to just 
talk to you about the teacher shortage. There's so many ways that you can retain teachers that doesn't cost any money. I can't tell you how many teachers have spoke to me saying that they quit because they were disrespected. They quit because they expressed something and got fired over it. So I, th that doesn't cost any money. It does not cost money to listen to a teacher's feedback. In fact, we'd have a bunch of teachers right now if we stopped firing them over voicing their opinions. That was in the top three. I did a survey. The top three things. Pay, yes, but being able to speak their voice without fear of getting fired. The other thing was student discipline, dealing with the kids in the schools. That's, that's it. I mean, if you guys do that, you'll be on track to have more teachers in our county. So I just hope you listen to that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Melanie Smith. Can you tell me when you start? Go ahead. Okay. Gentle people of the Oldham County Board of Education, today I stand before you to advocate the policies that foster inclusion and address systematic oppression within our educational system. As representatives of our community's futures, we have a unique responsibility to ensure that every student feels valued, supported, and empowered to reach their full potential. It is essential that we embrace diversity in all its forms and create a learning environment that celebrates the unique perspectives and backgrounds of our students. By fostering inclusion, we can cultivate an atmosphere where every student feels heard, understood, and enables them to contribute their best to our community. Systematic oppression has no place in our schools. We must actively work to dismantle any barriers that hinder equal access to quality education and resources for all students. This includes addressing disparities in educational funding, teacher training, and curricula to, to promote an equitable and in inclusive learning experience. And I will add that using buzzwords like CRT to accuse people of bad curriculum is absolutely not this agenda. <coughs> to achieve this, I urge the board to collaborate with educators, students, and community members to develop and implement policies that prioritize inclusivity and equity. We must embrace restorative practices that foster empathy and understanding, creating a safe space for dialogue and healing among students and staff alike. As we move forward, let us commit ourselves for continuous learning and growth as well. Regularly assessing the impact of our policies and initiatives will enable us to adapt and improve, ensuring that we are making meaningful progress towards a more inclusive and equitable educational system. In conclusion, I challenge the Oldham County Board of Education to be courageous leaders in the fight for inclusivity and justice within our schools. Let us come together to create an environment where all students can flourish regardless of their background, their experiences, and let our actions serve as a beacon of hope and progress for the generations to come. Thanks. Thank you. Kelly Nazer. And Stephanie White, you're on deck. Good afternoon. Um, I'm reaching out regarding our new literacy pilot program at Goshen Elementary. I have an upcoming um, third grade daughter. I've been uh, planning on sending to school again in the next few weeks. I have several issues with this EL program, but today I'm going to focus on the fact that my daughter and most of the other kids in her age group have just been having to stay at home over the last few years and do a variety of non-conventional educational approaches as a result of COVID. Children are undoubtedly still reeling and we surely will not see the lasting impact of this um, that our kids will have to deal with for years to come. Test scores are down and several children are still behind academically and emotionally and I believe it's reckless to introduce a pilot program that veers from the focus of essential core educational pillars. I'm also really disappointed in the way that this program has been unveiled. There are simply, um, they have had many parent surveys over the year and simply have not done this in a transparent way. This could have been done in a much more responsible way. Most parents in our area don't realize what's going on. But we are spreading the word and we're just not in favor of this change. I've also learned that we no longer even have a literacy coordinator to roll out this new program. 
I have enjoyed Oldham County Schools for my three children over the last few years. And if the priority in education, they're shifting from the essentials, I'm gonna be forced to look at different educational options for my family and for my children. Um, I will be looking for a place that offers serious core, uh, core essentials for our kids. I look forward to um, hearing where this goes and I hope that there, this isn't really just a closed book. Um, it's something that's a great concern. I have extra time and if this other mom is able to finish her sentence, that's, you know, she can take my time. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Stephanie White. And Scott Simpson, you're on deck. Hi, my name is Stephanie White. I am an Oldham County Schools parent. I am also um, coming to talk about, I didn't think it would come up, but it happened to come up today, uh, the teacher residency program and urge the board to relook at it. I'm currently a doctoral student at the University of Louisville, getting a PhD in curriculum and instruction. I have helped to instruct these students. I'm keenly aware of the program and what it works um, on. Uh, a lot of the other students that are in these classes with folks in the teacher residency program um, are undergraduate students at the University of Louisville taking classes with them. They might be in a master's program, they're in some other form of alternative certification, or they may be with a PhD candidate. All of those people, like next year, I will be an eligible rank one experienced math teacher with a PhD. I believe that any high school or middle school principal will hire me. I'm doing the program, the same program as these candidates in the teacher residency program. Across the board at UofL, there is an equity focus. The equity focus to address what you were saying does not bring people down. It looks for barriers and teaches pre-service teachers to come through and eliminate those barriers. And so gaining, so that all students can gain access to education. It does not lower anything for anybody else. But to the point that we're not going to look at that program because of some sort of a misunderstanding of the equity pillars that are in that program. I think it's denying students direct access to passionate, eager teachers. These are people that are leaving other professions and choosing to be teachers, and we are not giving our children access to them. Uh, but I do think you would hire an undergraduate who's coming out to be a middle school science teacher who had the same program courses, methods, field experience, etc. So I really am here to urge you to look again at the teacher residency program that Stephanie Wooten Burnett heads up at the University of Louisville that was presented last January. It is direct access to teachers who come in as teacher aides and then they are guaranteed to work here for the contracted amount of years. And so without doing that, you're just wiping away dozens of people that could be coming here uh, to teach when we are in desperate need of teachers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Scott Simpson and Amy Jones is on deck. It is Simpson, right Scott? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Board members and superintendent. My name is Scott Simpson. My family moved to this school district four years ago in hopes of my children re receiving the best public education that Kentucky has to offer. I ask myself if that is the case today. And I don't think it is. As years have gone by, a constant conversation I've had with my wife and other parents is how disappointed we are with this school district. I'm frustrated that my son ended school year last year without a full-time teacher and his grades suffer because of that. Recently, we received an email from the North Oldham High School saying that they're not likely to have a full-time teachers available this coming school year, which I think is absolutely infuriating and really pathetic. As a steward of my children's education, of their future and our family's finances in the way of taxes, I believe this school system is failing the education of my children and the use of our tax dollars. Now, we are certainly almost pulling our two younger children out of Goshen Elementary for lack of transparency uh, regarding the new curriculum changes. 
And hearing that the change was on horizon, my hope would be that we'd come up with a new curriculum that would be at least STEM-based and have a focus on STEM. That would be great. But the divisiveness of the chosen EL curriculum isn't what our schools need. I truly hope that school choice becomes a reality soon for the state of Kentucky to give this county some competition when it comes to schools. <laughs> Jason, as you build your empire of subordinates, the people who truly matter, the children and the teachers are being left behind. Where do your priorities lie? Is it with each and every child that needs an opportunity for success? Or the many teachers that give everything that they have for the children to be excited about their education? From where I stand, I don't believe they are a priority to you. The teachers deserve a competitive compensation and the children from kindergarten to seniors deserve a quality education to help make their dreams happen. Right now is the time to step up and to be the ones that lead this district to a great reputation it once had. I challenge the superintendent and tenured board members to do better. Thank you to the most recently elected board members for stepping up to the challenge. You are appreciated. Thank you. Amy Jones and Whitney Marion is on deck. Good evening. Uh, my name is Amy Jones and I am a parent of both a middle school and an elementary age student. Um, five years ago I went back to work and decided to be a substitute teacher. Um, and I have subbed nearly every day for the last five years. I have taken on multiple long-term jobs. I've taught second grade, third grade, fourth grade. I've taken on role, a role as an LD resource teacher and did that for seven months. Um, I've taught art multiple times. Teaching is my passion. Um, I simply um, would like to address you tonight regarding the issue of teacher vacancies. Teacher pay and sub pay. It seems like I see multiple job postings every day for positions here in Oldham County. With only a week until school starting, this is very alarming. Until last year, my family lived in Jefferson County, so I have mostly subbed there. After moving back to Oldham County, I had every intention of primarily subbing in our county. However, that has not been financially feasible. Even when offered jobs here last year, I chose to drive to Jefferson County from LaGrange nearly every single day. The pay I receive there is more than enough to make up for the gas that I spend to and from work. This year, my son's school had six classroom teacher vacancies as of the end of last week. While I obviously would love for them to get a full-time certified teacher in there, they asked if I would like to do one uh, temporarily. Uh, however, as Mr. Joe Dennis uh, said earlier, you do only pay your substitutes $14.93 an hour. In JCPS, where I also have multiple long-term job offers, I am paid at a higher rate. Uh, you also pay me at a lower rank than Jefferson County does. Um, this county doesn't seem to, to value what I can bring to the table. Um, I'd like to just share some quick numbers to hopefully shed some light on how poorly you pay your substitutes. I can't speak to teacher salary as I'm only experienced with my own, but I know that theirs is even worse. Here in Oldham County, my daily rate is only $104.54 before taxes. Assuming a seven hour school and work day, that is merely $14.93 an hour. I could literally make more flipping burgers and bagging groceries. In contrast, my daily rate in JCPS is $172, which includes a $7 a day raise. You guys, in contrast, only gave $2 a day. So that comes out to earning $24.57 an hour, far more reasonable for someone raising a family or for any adult for that matter. The daily rate difference is $67.46. Your $100 a month for teaching 10 days doesn't seem to touch that. That's a daily increase in JCPS. 
Finally, as I mentioned, I love taking on long-term jobs. Even with the higher pay rate and retro pay offered here in Oldham County, I would make approximately $1,500 more for a 21-day job. And they give you a $1,000 bonus after 20 days. I'm not suggesting that you can match other counties dollar for dollar. I understand that it can't be exactly the same. I am suggesting, however, that you should value this substitute teacher's perspective. You should value what I bring to the table and that you need me. I want nothing more to accept the job at my son's school. He asks me every day if I will take it and it makes me sad that our current pay scale and the small incentives that you give makes it simply not possible financially. If you want to attract and keep great teachers and subs here in Oldham County, you need to make significant changes. Please stop spending at the district level. Our teachers are the ones in the trenches, subs, bus drivers. They are the ones who deserve to earn a living wage. Time. If you continue to underpay, we will continue to lose staff and be unable to attract very willing employees such as myself. Thank you. Thank you. Whitney Marion and Ella Sayamala is on deck. She's after. Um, okay. I'm gonna finish for for Rosa. And exceeding minimum standards is not enough. Parents want to know that their children are safe at school, and all students receive the same level of security just because other counties fail to comply with state law or have fewer SROs doesn't mean that we can't do more. The goal should be one officer per building and our board should have a plan to fund additional officers. And I also brought that up at the safety town hall about hiring a float SRO. And I was told there was no plans for that um, for the times that school lack coverage for when officer has a doctor's appointment might have to leave for an hour has to go to CDW office, has to go to court. It leaves a time gap between when they're there. And I also found out that night that if you got a elementary school on campus, it starts what, 7.40? High school starts at nine o'clock, middle school. That, that officer, which really they should only work eight hours, right? You work eight hour day, I work eight hour day. That officer leaves at that eight hours and then there's no one there for to cover like Oldham County Middle School or East Oldham Middle School, or the elementary school, depending on that officer schedule. Um, that wasn't something I was aware of until recently either. Um, and that's actually pretty important, because it looks like you all were up 141% on drug and alcohol offenses. That was an email I just got sent in here. Um, so if you're really sharing these SROs between Oldham County Middle School, because kids get drunk in middle school, kids get high in middle school. It's a kid thing, it's what they do. They grow maybe up to adults to do it, I don't know. But it's what they do. So then you have them tied up at the middle school, maybe not over at the elementary school or preschool, or maybe they're over at the preschool and elementary school when they really need to be in the middle of school monitoring. You never know. Odom County Middle School just lost their SRO. He was really great. I saw some really great student interactions with him when I would volunteer there um, with the PTA. Um, the original thing I was gonna talk about was your all's fee schedule is the most confusing thing I've ever looked at in my entire adult life. I'm trying to sort through, I'd never seen a locker fee. I guess that was built into middle school fees. So when I got the email about the locker fee, I was like, what in the world is this? And then I also saw that the kindergarten fee is still on there. When I was trying to tally up fees for my kindergartner, I thought kindergarten was fully funded. I didn't know that $350 fee was still floating out there. Um, I don't have an invoice for him because he's not in my school bucks yet. So I, I really don't know. Um, but it's very confusing so if there's like some policies or there's some fees that aren't being assessed anymore like that $350 kindergarten fee they could probably save some confusion and um, leave me a little more wiggle room in my checkbook for when I have to go to back to school night this week or next week or whatever day it is I'm sure I'll get emails so that's all I had thank you <clears throat> Ella Sayamala Hi, my name is Ella Shamla and I am going into the ninth grade at South Oldham High School. I just moved here two years ago from Las Vegas. I have to tell you today that I am very, 
disappointed in the school board and all the adults making the decisions. I don't want to have to change schools. I really don't. But we are making our way to a tipping point. Doesn't anyone care about us? I don't think it's fair or acceptable for adults to be saying a bunch of excuses and that there's nothing they can do. Are you just going to keep watching everything go downhill? Or are you going to start having emergency town hall meetings to come up with some creative ideas? Will you continue to deny that there is anything wrong? And is there any real leadership? I'm hearing about all these teachers quitting. And I was looking forward to getting a really good math teacher at the new school. But they said that she is now leaving to go back to work for the private school that she used to work for. Last year, I had three teachers suddenly leave in the middle of the year. <coughs> three! It made things very confusing. I'm so afraid that we soon won't have any teachers left. Trying to focus in some of my classes is so hard with a chaotic environment. There are too many kids, and some make it so that the teachers can't teach. I can't hear what the teacher is saying. When it gets really bad, I get out my library book to read and tune out the chaos. The worst part is when I've been to the board meetings, it seems like there is so much money being spent on so many other things that don't seem important. And when parents talk, nobody cares or listens. Please, I don't want to have to change schools and go to a private school. Please figure it out, adults, before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Simpson is next, and Clint <coughs> Elliott, you're on deck. I was just uh, noticing and mentioning to my husband that when we moved here four years ago, um, our oldest was in seventh grade. And from kindergarten to seventh grade prior to moving here, I never once spoke at a board meeting. Not once. I didn't even go to a board meeting because things were awesome. Since moving here, this is my third time. I really don't like speaking in public or at a board meeting, so I would love it if we could just like get some things together here, folks. Um, so I spoke at a board meeting in April where I cited studies that have been done as to why teachers are leaving. The top three reasons found were low pay, behavioral issues, and increasingly being put in the center of culture wars. During that same meeting, as rumors swirled about the new um, controversial curriculum called EL Education um, being implemented at Goshen, um, sorry. Uh, I told you I don't like to speak in public. <laughs> um, and a Goshen teacher allegedly being fired for being vocal in opposition to the curriculum after she piloted it at Goshen last year. Miss Six spoke to the board about curriculum selection process saying that it would be slowed down, that there was an extension put on making a decision. She said, there would be multiple opportunities for parents and interested community members to review curriculum materials as well as a district window for review before adoption. According to EL Education's website, social justice is at the core of their curriculum and children are taught to search out injustices where they may not be obvious. Their curriculum includes only four topics per year rather than 12 to 13 that most other curriculums offer. Some will praise EL education being implemented for its dedication to social justice and accepting gender identities being the topic of elementary kids as they read, uh, being the topic elementary kids read and write about for most of the year through their language arts curriculum. Others will be angry at the choice made by the district. One thing we might all agree on is that it's a hot button controver controversial issue. About two weeks ago, I was made aware that Goshen is moving forward with EL education despite not fulfilling the promise made by Ms. Six. I've learned teachers didn't even know until last week that they would be teaching this new curriculum. 
JCPS is also moving to EL education and began the teacher training process months ago, which by the way, side note, what Oldham County family doesn't want to be just like JCPS, right? Um, additionally, our literacy coach, the person responsible for training the teachers on the new curriculum, quit. Last week, actually. Uh, can our teachers rise to the occasion? Of course, they're freaking rock stars. But why, during a massive staffing crisis, are we adding more onto the plates of our already underpaid and overworked teachers? Knowing, knowing it's among the top reasons teachers quit, why are we throwing our teachers into the middle, middle of a culture war with a new curriculum that will absolutely be controversial, controversial and divisive? I personally know several families who have already withdrawn their kids from Goshen this year due to EL education. And most parents don't even know what's happening yet. More will follow. Why has there been a lack, why has there been a lack of proper notice to families as Ms. Six promised? Is it because you know this curriculum is controversial and many parents will look for other options? Waiting until back to school night to brush over the new curriculum looks pretty bad. Where is the transparency? Whether this is the case or not, the optics are not good. The optics are that you, you yeah. waited until parents would have no other options. Like most people who moved to Oldham County, we moved here for the schools. We moved here to not be JCPS. It's a, this is really upsetting. I'm, I don't want to pull my kids out. My kids love their teachers. My kids love their friends but my kids are gone if you guys do EL this year. So I, I really hope, I'm, I'm praying, hoping, pleading, please don't do this. It's, it will legit destroy our school district. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you. Thank you for letting me finish. Okay. Clint, Elliot, you're next. Good evening. Famous baseball player Yogi Berra is credited with saying, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. Sounds sort of nonsensical, huh? Um, but the real story behind that, as I understand it, he was telling a friend how to get to his house and he lives on a circle drive and so when you come to the fork, you can either turn left or you can turn right and you'll get to the same destination that you're after. Seems like from what I've just sitting here tonight have heard the school district is at a fork in the road or a crossroads and really the decisions you all are making this month, next month, I mean whose idea was it a thousand plus pages of Kentucky School Board Association policies? What's wrong with the policies we already have? Whose idea was that and why? That would be a good question to respond and answer to the community but but it seems like we're at a fork in the road and really the decisions you make going forward are going to determine as as uh, Ms. Simpson just said are we going to become more like the Los Angeles Unified School District i.e. JCPS or go back to what Oldham County used to be when my boys graduated from South Oldham here um, this is a critical time and, and as I was sitting here I wasn't intending to speak but I think I heard you all adopt the Confucius Institute. I read an article this morning, just came across my feed, that was an alert about that. And so I started reading articles as I sat here, and I read one that said the State Department has declared that it is a propaganda arm of the Chinese Communist Party. Another article says Germany is considering withdrawing from any partnership because it is a tool for political influence of the Chinese Communist Party. Another says just plainly, it's a Chinese Trojan horse. Did you all know that when you voted tonight? Y'all are the leaders that we look to, to watch over the kids and, and respect the, the values of the families here. I spoke last month about some of those policies and the great danger of incorporating gender identity as a protected class. Contrary to how the law is developing, contrary to the stories we hear from families and detransitioner testimonies today, 
It's not only wrong, it's dangerous to affirm a condition in children that needs to be compassionately treated by adults. So it's really back to the question, who and why? I think of a passage from Old Testament, Jeremiah the prophet, when the Lord spoke through the prophet and said to his people, be careful the path you're on. And, and called them to walk in the ancient ways, the ancient path, the good ways that we used to know here. And yet they shook their fist and said, we will not pay attention. I hope that's not our response as a school system here in Oldham County. I would again advocate to consider policy 10.2, which allows you to appoint a citizen committee to help you navigate these issues. Listen to the people. Listen to their concerns. More than just a monologue that we have here once a month, but have a dialogue with those in the county. And another thing I heard tonight, this sounds pretty cool, um, the coloring my town, I like that, coloring Oldham County. What concerns me, it says in the document, this shall not include any churches. Why is that? Aren't churches a pretty critical, important, valued part of Oldham County? Shouldn't they be part of the big picture of Oldham County that we are trying to communicate to our kids? Time. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. Gretchen Chitwood. I can't say much about EL education that hasn't already been conveyed to you um, via email and public expression and through other conversations. Um, so I'd like to tell you what some educators who have used EL education have to say about it. In a survey of 200 teachers in the Charleston School District, where EL education was implemented off, over several grade levels, um, only one in eight teachers said that they were excited about EL education. Over 80% of the teachers surveyed said that EL education was not an improvement over any other previous curriculums that they had used. In this survey, educators were permitted to make anonymous statements, and you'll see why in a moment. On January 9th of 2023, a teacher stated that this curriculum will single-handedly drive teachers out of the profession. We can hardly afford that. Jody Stallings, Stallings excuse me, is the director of the Charleston Teachers Alliance, and concerning EL education, he stated that the politicalization of this um, has made this curriculum toxic for teachers and students in a really unnecessary way. Now that can be interpreted in a number of ways, but to that he added this. Some teachers have been silent on the academic concerns of Yale education for fear of being labeled racist. I think that deserves repeating. Some teachers have been silent on the academic concerns with Yale education for, being lab uh, for fear of being labeled racist. That's divisiveness built in. 69% of these teachers surveyed said that they did not expect to see any significant growth or achievement from their students with this program. Now that's not comparing them to other curriculums or other students. That is an A to B direction not expecting to see significant growth and achievement from their students with this program. Now there are those who will tell you that there are also positive reports about Yale education. So I would like to read what a teacher said on a site this week. This is a site that is dedicated to teachers who are currently using Yale education. It's a support group essentially if you get on there and read because once you implement this program teachers need a support group. This teacher's name is Erin Crouch McCowey, and she said, she asks, excuse me, are there any research studies that are not commissioned by EL education themselves? I have gone down a rabbit hole for a week, but the only positive studies I have found were paid for by EL education. Everything else I could find outside of that was not favorable. I'm going to assume this educator, educator has done some research in her 
experience. And for a week, she tried to find a research study not paid for by EL Education that praised EL Education. So that's very telling. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle Elliott. Good evening. It's been a while, I believe at least a year, maybe a little bit more. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I pulled my kids out of Odom County Schools um, last year. Um, my last straw was the bathroom policy. Um, but hearing what I've been hearing, I would have done it going forward if my child was going to have the EL. But I didn't come here to talk about that. What I, I didn't actually come here to speak at all, but a, a couple things came up tonight. Um, one was the K-5 Language Arts Core Framework, the presentation by uh, Ms. Dance. It was wonderful. What I saw up there in my experience this last year pulling my kids out of public school and the different education they're getting, phonics is key for these kindergartners, not sight word based learning. Phonics. They're, I'll go on. So everything I saw up there was wonderful. The one key piece that I would like to mention that I didn't see, two pieces, spelling. There was nothing in there about spelling. I remember when my child was in element, my Otis was in elementary, he had spelling test one year and that was it. Um, the confidence of these kids when you don't teach them that, it, how do you expect them to keep, I mean, it, sorry, it's awful. Um, the other piece of it was cursive, again, he had cursive one year. Um, his handwriting, because of Chromebooks, was horrible when we came out. And he was only a third grader, but still, his handwriting should have been, his teacher had him writing cursive for an entire year because his handwriting was so bad. And I blame it on the Chromebooks. I believe that is part of it. And I was a parent who advocated for those. I was PTA. I helped fundraise to get those Chromebooks. Um, but I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And now I do know. And um, something to look at. Um, spelling test. The one other thing I'll say is um, Kentucky is one of two states that does not have any other kind of program uh, in charter schools, voucher program, savings program. North Dakota is the other one. Someone said something to me because of course one of the things you always hear when you bring up charter schools is oh it's going to take away from the public school. Someone said something to me, and it has it rang true, and I can't get it out of my head, and I don't think I will, because I'm going to share it as much as I can. If a parent is happy with the education their child is getting and the environment in which they're getting it, they're not going to pull their kid out of their school. So if you are worried about a mass exodus, do better. That concludes public expression for tonight. And we're moving, oh, did you wanna? Sure. Oh, okay. Um, like, I appreciate, I'll say a, a couple of thoughts. The uh, public expression is not designed for a two-way conversation, so, um, but I say this very respectfully, a, a couple of thoughts. One, each of you who have spoken tonight, uh, really appreciate uh, the concerns. I appreciate uh, the manner in which you presented those concerns. And I will certainly, I don't want to speak for our board collectively or individually, but uh, for myself, and, I, and I, I will say that I know that we're listening. So uh, know that, uh, that we hear those. Uh, one, one uh, a couple of things. One, it was, uh, there's indication about uh, concerns about whether we're following laws um, that are state statute, those kinds of things. We will always follow uh, state law and we'll certainly always try to do that. That's, that is a uh, absolute. Um, but I do appreciate someone uh, making reference to that in terms of um, concern. Uh, there's not been any adoption taking place in terms of curriculum. I know that uh, our elementary school, Goshen Elementary, is working hard to communicate and share and be uh, try to work on uh, being uh, and working to be transparent to show t uh, parents uh, what that looks like. But there's not been an adoption taking place. So please share that with uh, Goshen. I know Dr. Radoski would be happy to talk with you. I do respect what was said tonight. Um, Recruitment and retention. 
there are just a couple of reminders and some of you may not be aware so just a couple of points I want to make in February our board approved approximately 15 action items to recruit and retain our staff both certified and classified when I say certified and classified those are teachers those are bus drivers those are custodians we did those we came up with those as a result of staff voice we um, discussed and shared all of this information and the actions that we took with all 1500 employees myself face to face with all 1500 full-time employees that was um, something we uh, worked really hard was it enough no do we need to do more yes will we absolutely the all of that information is posted on our website with the voiceover powerpoint if you would like to see that or want direct access please contact me directly and I will send you that link or have someone send that link to you over the last two years we have done a seven percent increase which does include two step increases our district over the last seven to ten years it's, uh, has not done anything quite like that is it enough no it is not as you heard um, Dr. Shelton shared tonight about the uh, f financial report as we close out FY23 we have worked diligently to to reduce expenses to be in a position to continue to do more sometimes the best predictor of future success is past uh, <coughs> past uh, action right so we have taken action our teachers have said Jason please don't talk to us about what you plan to do please show us and we have tried teacher pay is extremely important but the other side the other issue to that is also college and university programs being able to produce like they once did before and that is certainly something we are seeing across our state and across our country JCPS certainly is where we do not want to be like anybody else other than Oldham County and I appreciate the pride and the passion that was demonstrated tonight about wanting the best for Oldham County I can assure you as superintendent that no one else shoulders that responsibility thinks about that more than I do I do not say that for you to come and pat me on the back I say that as a as a very humble uh, way to say we're going to continue to do all that we can and as you did tonight if there's questions or concerns please seek more additional information um, from whether it be a principal whether it be myself I always try to respond to every email or my staff will sometimes I might miss something but some of you I do I have spoken to directly and will continue to try to do that uh, I know the way in which you presented and the passion that you have that's what makes Oldham County special we're going to continue to work really really hard moving forward and I ask for your support because if you came out of this meeting tonight and what I would share with our staff during January and February if you came out of this meeting tonight and you feel good about the some of the comments that I made please share that but we're going to continue to do more um, and we're going to work really hard our board is engaged um, but we always the only reason we exist is because of our students we have about 12,200 students in our district and that's the only reason that we're here and we're going to continue to try to really work hard to focus on that thank you for sharing your concerns thank you for being here tonight thank you madam chair and thank our board you. okay um next up sir are some action items yes ma'am consider approval of the fy23 unaudited financial report board members do you have any questions can i get a motion to approve made by Mr. Dodson, seconded by Mrs. Sheffer, all those in favor, and that's 5-0. Oh, do you want, we need to get Jane back in here. Um, yes. Um, Mr. Deves, can you, can you, tra she must have stepped outside. Can you track, that first action item was 5-0. All five, all five board and members. And it was Dodson and Sheffer. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Okay, next up. Find my place. Consider approval of FY23 school donations. Board members, any questions? Motion to approve. Made by Mrs. Clem, seconded by Mr. Dodson. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. Next, sir. Yes, consider approval of FY24 fundraising requests. 
Any questions? Board members? Yes. This is the this is what was turned in. Um, they were due by the beginning of July. So if somebody has something that's not on this list, they will need to submit a form and it has to come before us okay. in order but to it do it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the proper form just has to be filled out and it's in it and it can't happen before it's approved. Okay. Any other questions? Motion to approve? Made by Mrs. Sheffer, seconded by Mrs. Clem. All those in favor? And that's 5 0. Do we do energy reports or do you want? Oh, um, just for the for board member review. Board members, in your packet is an energy report that is an informational item only that you all can review. And Mr. Dotson, would you mind reading us into executive session? We need to consider executive session pursuant to KRS 61.8110.810.1C to discuss litigation preparation, the public disclosure of which jeopardizes the board's position, and KRS 61.8101K and KRS 156.5576C for preliminary discussions related to the evaluation of superintendent by the board. At this time, we need a motion to go in executive session pursuant to KRS 61.810-1C to discuss litigation preparation, the public disclosure which would jeopardize the board's position, and KRS 61.810-1K, and KRS 156.5576C, for preliminary discussions related to the evaluation of the superintendent of the board. Can I get a motion to go into executive session? Made by Mr. Dennis, seconded by Mrs. Clem. All those in favor? And that's 5-0.